Super slow rhythms, easy to freestyle. You don't have to take too long to up up with. Oh shoot, man, I'm not even good at slow freestyle. Freestyle, it's been a while. I want you to smile, so join me and just Robert Young and these trees. Yeah. By the trees, I mean Mr. Andrew Maine. He's part human. Freestyle. Also a dryad. <laughs> sorry. Speaking of dryads, let's get fryhead. I got these mushrooms. They'll make the world seem amazing. What's up, Mr. Price? I hope that everything's nice. Yeah. <laughs> slow, slow motion freestyle's gotta be like yeah. the, new, the new karaoke. Oh. 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 Yeah. <laughs> And it's like it's like you're get instead of the lyrics, you're just given a rhyming dictionary yeah. <laughs> that shows up on screen. On screen. On screen. Ah! <laughs> oh, that's on screen. That's how you activate the hint system is your screen. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Hello everybody. We're gonna get started with weird things here. Uh, yeah, and uh, before we do, can we can we settle a debate? Okay. My daughter, my daughter is I, I'm all like a <clears throat> Me, super cool. Like, oh, why don't you learn how to drive a stick shift? Uh -huh. He's like, stick shift? That's so much work to be such a dork. I was like, oh, what would be cool? She says, learning how to fence. And I'm like, okay, one of those requires like months of training. The other one I could teach you this afternoon. So also, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's cool to drive stick shift. So number one, it's not. Like it's definitely not cool to drive yeah, stick no, shit. Yeah. Hey, man, well, no. yeah, it's 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 more cool to go to steal a car and go. I don't know. So the point is that pedals. this is occupational training for your daughter to become a car thief. Yes, or the, a more yes. effective car thief. Yes, yes, yes. So you're worried right now. Worst case scenario is she's a mediocre car thief and can only thieve. Roughly seventy percent of the cars on the road. Probably ninety percent. Ninety percent of the cars on the road. But you get the point. Okay? And that number's but, but only going up. Also, yeah. she'll nev never have a starring role in a Fast and Furious that's franchise true. movie. No, that, that's if she I doesn't she know can, how if she to. She can fence. She might, Brian. It's oh, a different yeah. twist. Oh yeah. She's, she's too slow to steal that car. And guard. Exactly. And also, it she's takes a months fence to teach. Who fences? Yes. A fence who fences. Oh. Fence. Dude, she's gonna like chop off a uh, 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 shark. Charlize Theron's like sideshow Bob wig or whatever else she has in the new movie because they always give her a silly haircut. She'll just cut that oh, some bitch right off. Mm -hmm. She can be yeah. um, a penne, pe penne a pay. Oh, uh, there we go. So I think we're is all it, in on it, fencing then. Yeah, pe that's the name. We of agreed, the, fencing's better. The fence, that's Good. The name of the sword. Settled. Yeah, that's Judas. <laughs> all of J Judas also used a knife. You yeah. used a blade. Yeah. Because he couldn't drive a stick shift. <laughs> Judas would never have betrayed Jesus if he had known what it was like to be one with his yeah. automobile. Yeah, yeah, that's why he betrayed him is because he ain't never won a quarter mile race because yeah. he didn't know how to drive stick. <laughs> he really, never he had really did. He really did race I mean, for you Jesus. You know what? I'll, I'll, I'll give a thousand dollars to anybody who could prove to me that Judas Iscariot yeah. did not betray Jesus uh, because he never had no Jeep. Did not betray Jesus because he didn't have no Jeep. Yeah. Yeah, it checks out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that goes side. Hello, everybody. All right. Hello. Um I ooh, I forgot to hit a button here. Give me oh. one extra few minutes here. Uh hope how would everybody have a good weekend? Anything fun happen this weekend? Uh, I, saw, I saw Ric Flair make his first ever Lucha Libre uh, appearance in history. Whoa. Did he win? As a surprise. Ass? Rico Rico Flair? Rico! Uh, uh, no, he just came out, and then he got involved in the match, and he chopped, and, and everybody got chopped, and everybody went, woo! And his daughter, who is a star for WWE, uh, was sitting next to us in the crowd wearing a hoodie, despite the fact she was fairly conspicuous being a six-foot white woman in a hoodie wearing very expensive snakeskin boots. Uh, what, and uh, what's her name? Charlotte, Charlotte Flair, and uh, she, um, I, I, po I poked my, I, I elbowed my buddy who was at the, at the match with me, and I just kind of like gave him a sly point, mm. uh, and he goes, you think that's Charlotte? 
<laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, just, uh, ma'am, like, excuse me, yeah, excuse me. No, Do you know then, Mr. Flair? Then he goes, no, she's not that short. <laughs> <laughs> then she made her way you to another You think that's Charlotte? Row. Yeah. Charlotte Flair? <laughs> hey, Rick, you know that you know the daughter hey, you're looking for? your daughter's here. <laughs> well, look at this. Yeah. So that was a, that was a fun thing that happened uh, on Saturday. Was this a person that works in the industry? No. See, that's it. Is like for people who are outside of like TV or film and stuff like this, mm -hmm. often when they see people, they don't realize... They're not on a screen. That person's in front of you. Yes. You know? Yes. I not, remember, not aware they may have walked in the middle of something. Yeah, they can hear you. You know, I remember I'm walking through an airport one day. It was like early in the morning, and I see this, uh, this tall black guy pushing the stroller of this kid, and he is exhausted. He's exhausted. This guy looks like he's been traveling all day and just pushing this thing. Like, uh, and I'm like, huh. Looks like Montel Williams. Cool. And I keep yeah. walking, and I hear a guy go, hey, is that Monty? Hey, Monty! Hey, Monty! How you doing? How you doing? And Monty was like, uh. Yeah. It's just like, I've never felt more bad for somebody, because he's like, you know, he's nodded, you know, which is give him credit for. But it was like, holy cow. Yeah. And this other guy's like, was... oh, my God, this is the most amazing thing in the world. Like, Montel Williams just sprung out of reality for yeah. that moment didn't spend 18 hours flying from somewhere you know that's what i was i was kind of bummed because if if she were still right next to us i feel like i would have had the opening just be like big fan that's all i really want whenever i see a celebrity that i like it's just like hey big fan m keep it moving like i think mm. that's that's something that nobody who who works in in a public media will ever be like fuck you like you know like and even if she's like in in disguise she's you know uh, probably going to give a nod but yeah, anyway, that was that was a fun, a fun moment. Uh, hey, so real quick, uh, my relationship, as you understand it, with being recognized, how would you describe it? Erratic. Yes, <laughs> correct, correct. Sometimes uh, very excited, oftentimes uh, uh, repulsed to the point that you want to dive out of a window. Uh, times I like getting recognized usually involve me... Uh, doing, doing nothing. Getting extra fries. Performing, performing or doing a thing that is worthy. Right. <clears throat> uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, uh, th things I don't want to get recognized for being that guy from Torchies. Uh, yes. I listened to this green room episode, by the way, uh, I listened no, 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 to this no, no, no. green room. No, it no, happened on Saturday. I'm not saying that it didn't happen again. I'm saying that, that you have an odd mixture you're, you're conflating two things of like being recognized as a celebrity and being a regular at torchies right okay which is across the street from your house and you right. love okay right so we're at a gig yeah on saturday okay oh and somebody just recognized you from torchies yes <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! I'll leave it to you. Oh yeah, to decide it, how I felt uh, about that. Yeah, just let me know where the body is. I'm sure you loved you being it. so close to that many cameras. Quite literally. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, look, it removes earbuds. Yes. What, what's up? Do you eat at torches a lot? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Yeah, I do. That's why people move to LA, though. By the way. Because like that, like like what Andrew was saying, like there is just like more of a culture of like Be you, cool. you can you can cut yeah, just you've you've seen this ain't this ain't the first time that you've seen somebody around. There's like a little bit less of the small town, like, hey you like uh uh but but there's yeah, there's a little bit of, of 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 anonymity, unless you're like, you know, Bieber or Michael Jackson or something like that, where it's just insane. Yeah, if I saw Michael Jackson today, I'd lose my mind. <laughs> Because he's gone. Because he's dead. Oh, he's dead. Yeah. I thought it was because yeah. you would finally call him out for his pedophilia. I don't know what I'm going to do. Why, your silence has been deafening on this. <laughs> 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 hey, you remember when you were going to do, what was it? Star, star, starlight? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have a starlight, starlight shit. Okay, come on. Get Quincy in there. <laughs> Get Quincy in there. That's how many call Quince. Quincy. Quince. Uh, all right, you guys want to do the Weird Things podcast? Let's do it. Yeah. All right, Andrew. Let me. I'm sorry. Oh. Just I go like one second. Sorry, sorry. No worries. No worries. All right, I fine. did get the we first. We like, another 15 15 minutes. Minutes. He's like, <laughs> just one second. I need to scrub my name from anything associated with this. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
Torchies, huh? They recommend they rec they recognize you as being she the guy used who used to be a bartender at Torchies. Oh, that I get though. But she was just hanging out at this other bar, and she was like, "Hey, hey, hey!" She used to hang around Torchies a lot. I'm like, "Still do?" No, that she's that, like that. Actually, well, now now I'm here, and I'm like, "Cool." No, but you want to know what? I actually uh, uh, I feel like that gets a slight pass in that the relationship between bartender and regular is is an odd one because it's very warm yeah but it is professional professional uh but at the same time if eh, you're sometimes if you're in well exactly because it can very easily pierce that veil of like oh no we're friends like it wouldn't be shocking if you were like if somebody was like oh i'm really into this thing you're into like oh if you give me your social media i'll i'll send you this stuff or i'll i'll, I'll tag you when i find stuff blah 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 blah, blah. so it's like that was at an attempt by her to be like, oh, wait, are we like, we've talked so much at Torchies, like, now are we outside the bar, friends? And I think she probably didn't factor in the body, vector that you were also body, shooting. Body posture matters a lot in these things. <laughs> wait, what was she doing? Hey, hey, hey. You, you used to go to Torchies a lot, huh? <laughs> all right. <laughs> I all right. I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out where the bartender is coming from the position of power in this situation. Because she's not tending bar. She is a I patron mean, at the bar. Sure. Who's calling but you're me not out. tending bar either. No, I'm trying to buy a courtesy Diet Coke because I wanted to use the pisser at this other place. Yeah. Because we're shooting at a taco truck in the same park yeah and uh and i'm like yeah i, I still do go to torchies and she goes yeah i, I feel so. like we should cut the video of afghanis clinging to the airplane <laughs> and trying to escape the country <laughs> as we go right. as we go not you know none of us laughing at the plight of it as we go through our problems yes exactly I got recognized by the it's a larry david episode it, it, <laughs> it is very curb your enthusiasm it, it's out of context that's the problem <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Are we uh, ready to do the, pro the program, Andrew? Now all ready. I can think of is the curb scene of just like, it's the posture! How are you going to do this? It's a power posture! It's a power posture! <laughs> hey, aren't you the scant school guy? <laughs> okay, that's fine, because yes, I am. Uh, why, yes, okay. a half billion people know me from that. Uh, good on you. Bye. Didn't, didn't you sell me a computer on Dell? <laughs> I I think you're thinking of the dude you got a Dell guy. No, you say your old career. Hang when you were selling. Didn't you sell me a computer yeah. from Dell or were you, something? Were, did did you ever work at Dell? Lunch? I may, maybe, man. I, I've been around. That man is dead. That that man is long <laughs> <Sorry>. dead. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Are you calling Brian Brushwood from Dell? Well, he can't come to the phone right now because he's pee dead. Your pants oh. On the swing set in the fifth grade. Yeah. This is that small town stuff, man. It's like, <laughs> like, like you may be valedictorian, but if you pooped your pants in third grade, oh, you are, always. you are walking across that stage. Hey, it's, yeah, no, it, uh, it, uh, it, Poopy th McGee, thirty-year reunion, you return with a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Poopy's here. Yep, 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 yep. All right. Yeah, I like the reminder. Brian was a normal guy once in the chat. <laughs> all right. Let's... I think after things we could talk about all the suck jobs we've done. Oh, uh, that would be fun. Actually, uh, I would, yeah. I would love to do that. As long as it doesn't happen in Margate, Justin. Nothing to Margate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, no. Hey, I gotta one thing. Uh, uh, so I'm in the Indigenous uh, History Museum <laughs> in Mexico City. And I come across a picture that I just sent to Andrew that's uh, a, a file photo of me in the warehouse in Margate <laughs> blogging for iTricks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. I'm, like, I'm like, that guy still had it better than you in the sweaty yeah, exactly. Margate warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> you wish Got you wish you with him too. with a brand new Mac and <laughs> space and you know. All right, all right. Yeah, like I would loose. open up the door there. Mm -hmm. 
You know, it looked like a count. He'd come there like he'd be like, you know, sweaty t shirt, all this. It would look like a counterfeiting operation or something. <laughs> well, because like, you had to turn off the cool. AC to record audio. Yeah. Anyway, all right, let's go. All like right. I am now. All right, cool. All right, Andrew, I'll count you in for the Weird Things podcast here in three, two, Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Justin Robert Young. What up? And the friend of the Torchies guy, Mr. Bryce Castillo. I met the Torchies guy once. God damn. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 cool. yeah. We can get weirder than this. this. Sal salutations, everybody. Sal yes. A cheers. Cheers. Uh, gentlemen. I want to talk about this would be it'll be a pick, but I want to open up this because I think if you have anything, if you have any interest in SpaceX and Starship or anything like this, I cannot recommend this enough. Uh, Everyday Astronaut. Uh, he's the guy that does a lot of cool coverage of space stuff. He's been doing this for several years, does deep dives into all sorts of things about rocket engines and stuff. Um, he's had a pretty good rapport back and forth with Elon Musk. That's Tim Dodd I'm talking about, the everyday astronaut. And Elon gave him a behind the scenes tour of the SpaceX facility and where they're building Starship. And it's in three parts. The first two are each an hour long and the second part's half an hour. And it's just Elon walking around the facility, explaining things, talking about production, talking about rocket engines. If you're into that kind of thing, it's amazing. If you're not, just fast forward. So this, it, 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 so it, this is literally just a guided tour through the Starship facility with the guy asking questions to Elon, and uh, uh, I guess we're seeing some on-screen graphics to kind of illustrate what this uh, uh, what what this looks like. But that's that's amazing access. That's insane access. Uh, incredible. Yeah, exactly. And Elon, not, and Tim doesn't even have to ask that many questions because Elon, Elon wants to share. Elon yeah. wants to explain things. And you go through these humongous, like, you know, they, oh, they, they're building a tent and these are these prefab humongous structures and stuff. And parts of spaceships all around there. And it's insane. And they talk about the construction process, the iteration through all this sort of stuff. Really, really specifics about, you know, rocket engines and uh, ISP, all these other sorts of things about this, you know, the how they're iterate on this. And it's just, you sort of, you go, cool. It feels like an industrial tour. They're like, like those are all parts of rockets. It's like that scene from the JJ Abrams Star Trek movie where you see the you know Starship Enterprise being built. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. So again, if you're a space nerd, really, 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 really recommend this. Elon goes into also he talks about his five pieces of advice about manufacturing or building things. And he's very he'll say this. The guy is an eccentric to be sure. But when you listen to him, you know, he points out, he goes, well, I did this wrong. I did this wrong. I thought this was important. I realized I completely screwed this up. He talks about like the Model 3 manufacturing. He has these five points that he makes, which uh, about, you know, simplify, then you delete, then you optimize, then you accelerate, then you automate. And he's like, yeah, the Model 3, I did them all in reverse. And that was a problem. And, you know, I forget my own rules and stuff. And so just, just really, really highly recommend checking this out. Um, uh, I've yet to see the Jeff Bezos tour. I, I I will say that's that is something that is amazing about new media that you know in in a bygone era that would be I mean what a a a sixty minutes piece that'd probably be boiled down to like you know maybe <laughs> like ten like, minutes or whatever if, if, if with seventy five lawyers clearing everything between point A and point Z. Yeah, I mean, and and let's say that Elon is totally open and he's waving everything and he's just like, nope, just shoot and edit it and everything. But it's like so much would we get left on the cutting room floor. You'd we'd probably be intercut with another interview with Elon and in which you know something else might. Uh, take the conversation somewhere else, but uh, there is such a tremendous worth to literally just watching. You know him him walking through there is content is is great, super rare content, and it's just it, it never ceases to amaze me the kind of whenever new media sort of pioneers or or does something that like just seems obvious, which is hey, why don't we just follow Elon Musk around talking about this like you know generationally defining uh, a space vehicle. What, uh, is it worth, and maybe this is more of an after things topic, but it's like as a heuristic, 
it seems like a pretty good idea to just have no filter. Because on the one hand, you're going to say a lot of things that'll get you into trouble, but you will never, ever have to remember what you said before, because you will always just say whatever's on your mind at any given time. Uh, uh, Justin and I over lunch were talking about political figures and their machinations and keeping their stories straight and all that stuff. Like, you, you just don't have to do that if you just run your mouth off, which, again, not to make it political again, but I think that's, that's, that's what Donald Trump did and, and what got him into trouble, uh, but also, also got him a pass on so many things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in in general, uh, and to kind of go wider than than politics, and you know, having a free tongue is, uh, I think, certainly more interesting. Uh, I think where uh, even people like Elon have gotten themselves in trouble is is when that crosses over into degrading the institution that they're representing, <laughs> like. As much as we, you, you know, if, if you are a fan of Twitter content, then you enjoy when Elon Musk weighs in on, on the, the issues of the day. Uh, or as, as a fan of wacky things happening, you think it's uh, hilarious when he takes a half uh, a puff of a, uh, of, of a blunt on Joe Rogan. Uh, Andrew, as a, as a, uh, a Tesla stockholder, <laughs> uh, uh, after, <laughs> after it dipped in the moment, not a particular fan could could have could have done with that rest of that Joe Rogan thing and maybe not the puff of the blunt. I I hear you. I would say to Brian's point, I think there's a difference between there's being saying things what you think, and then there's obviously realizing when not to say anything. That and I'd say that like obviously you can say like with with yeah, Elon's fairly very 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 open about stuff, and sometimes like you know sometimes we don't need to have opinions on everything. You know, not speaking him, but like I know myself because sometimes I have to I try to learn to be more, eh, whatever. But like I do agree to the point though that like uh, it, it, it's there's the caricature of who he is, and then if you just see what he's where like you know the arrogant billionaire. I'm like you know I listened in one hour you know him spend a considerable amount of time talking about billion dollar decisions he made that went the wrong way that said no this is the wrong way to do it about stuff and that was what impressed me was the fact that like that transparency that openness and not not let me not shy away from my mistakes publicly and private and there's of course sometimes times when you sort of maybe don't show that but like i think there's a tremendous value to it because you kind of feel like what he will tell you privately is what he'll tell you publicly yeah uh, uh, but in general, I, I do think Brian, what, what you're saying is the trend that the, the, the trend is less rewarding to the, the ultra careful managed persona and toward the consistently so, engaging, uh, uh, free willing persona I, oh, away from and the, I would, I would the, address the to, like curate, curated projection sure. as opposed to the authentic yeah. source material. And I would even say things like in a chat, people point out when he made the funding secured point and like that when he said, oh, is he is misleading. He and this was testimony. This was disputed. He'd walked out of a meeting with one of these, you know, one of these big, huge foundational fund, one of these dynastic foundational funds that had said, yeah, we'd be interested in taking you private, whatever. And you he thought that was the deal. He thought that was real. Was did that meet the SEC threshold or whatever like that? Maybe not. But that wasn't a case of where he just made something up. He'd had a meeting like there is these, there are incredible amounts of capital that are in these different you know places, and it would have been a great deal for them had they done that, you know, um, you know. But the point was, is he was speaking sincerely, like, oh yeah, I think they're sincerely we could do this. And so you know, of course, you know, when you're dealing with you know billion dollars and billions and billions and the fates you know fortune, fates and fortunes of many. And you have stakeholders, and that is the issue. It's how does it affect your stakeholders? Exactly. It, it, it's the institution. And that, that really is where I think the modern, the modern line is being drawn is like, uh, okay, keep it interesting. Keep it exciting. Uh, 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 the more open you are, the more people will, will reward you at the very least with attention. You, know, uh, we'll, we'll, you can figure out later whether or not it's positive or negative. Uh, but at the end of the day, that, that is where it crosses the line. It's like, like are, are the people that are counting on you less than because you needed to do the thing or say the thing, you know, that, that made it, uh, you know, are, are you adding or subtracting? And oftentimes, like you pointed out, you really don't know until after that thing has been said or done. I mean, that's, that's one of those things where um, if you're willing to own 
your own failures. If you're willing to say out loud, I apologize, that came out wrong, or I was misinformed at the time, or that's what I thought back then, or whatever, there is extraordinary power in just one simple tit-for-tat algorithm of a uh, question comes in, what does brain say? Brain says this. Yeah. Uh, and maybe, maybe brain says too much for right then, maybe brain says wrong thing for right then, but, but at least you always get to lean back on, uh, uh, hey man, I, I sent the question to the guy upstairs and the guy upstairs, From the hip. AKA my brain came yeah. back with this. Bad. Uh, speaking of which, I, th I think you were out of town last week, Justin. Did 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 we talk about how how close we are to to actually seeing uh, uh, the BFR in full state taken off? Uh, uh, because it's a big it's a big boat. We did talk about how very big the ship was. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we I, did I, not I, have a date at that time. Had, yeah, yeah. Did you get a chance to? I'm sure you saw that, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, fully that's, assembled. That's a big, book that's a big, uh, big some. They yeah, may do that bitch. again today or tomorrow. That was the uh, the talk about trying to put the assembly together. Uh, and the vid the video they get into, he says that the biggest problem, the most complex part, is isn't the boosters, it's the ground support equipment because we've talked about we've we talked about uh, Mechazilla. So here's the plan. Plan is you put the starship and the booster on the launch mount. Okay. They launch, Starship goes up, booster goes up, then the booster comes back down and gets caught. <laughs> same as Starship gets caught by these big mechanical oh arms. Oh my god. Which will then uh, position him back in there. Mega hugger. <laughs> yeah, it, wow. it, it is a hug. Yeah, it's a hug. For, it's a friend. It's, it's a shaped like a friend. Hug. Wow. <laughs> and so it's so good. <laughs> instead of a, a secure descent to like a barge I, or the actual pad, it catches it in air. Oh my God. Now, wouldn't that now? <clears throat> I know that mm, some of the landings have not been, let's say, um, gentle, explosion free. <laughs> um, I guess they must understand the danger of that in proximity to the booster that it's like live placing well, it uh, no, well i would imagine number one that the booster is empty right that there's not fuel in it uh although when, it, when it's coming back special down. yeah circumstances right oh okay there's still going to be some fuel and they're always going to residual I, it's not remember we watched the things explode and it wasn't like oh my god we didn't think it was going to explode it was like, all right, add that to the list of things that can explode. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. now we'll know. And that was the whole purpose. Why we watched them blow up was that he talks about the difference between when they're building the Dragon capsule, he says, we can't have failures. He says, the way we test that is completely different, way more time consuming, whatever, to test that because you can have zero failures. He says, with Starship, without people on them, early stages, he says, failures are fine because that's how we like but he's like every time it blew up it wasn't on my list of things that could have happened we're like okay this is an issue so not there are two different procedures not yeah. only that but worth remembering that at this point uh finally they're they're gambling with house money like like they're already ahead with with how many times they've been able to reuse first first stage boosters and all that yeah, I don't like I'm, you know, we can see the chat room we get some skepticism about the catch. I am too. I was skeptical about landing boosters. I was skeptical about Falcon Heavy. I was skeptical about Starship. And so who who gets to be the authority here on what they're gonna be able to do on physics? You know, we'll see. Like I'm like, I'll see they pull like it, I agree, it looks like a complex thing. Like, will they do it? But so was landing boosters. So. Yeah. Uh, although to Bryce's point, I can definitely see a, a, a question of since you're bringing it to a more permanent structure, like if it explodes somewhere around there, like is there just a higher risk more than than just the you know the the the, the booster well, itself exploding? But I mean, I guess at I that mean, point, the, when, I mean, when you're talking I mean, again, about this it's, level it's, of it's, stuff, it's then, house money where it's like like yeah, like like we've saved so much by reusing so many first stage engines that we how could many, buy build twelve. Yeah. Things. How, how many times? Yeah, they because he's building. That's the thing too. Is it? The, the number of iterations and tests that'll happen without people on it is immense. And that that's like he, in the talk, in the video, he goes into the whole thing of like, you know, designing one or two is, e building one or two is easy. Building a, a manufacturing process and the cost per engine that they're reducing it to is insane. Like we're paying something like $180 million per like engine that's a go on the SLS. And granted, those are big ass thrusters, but like the cost he's talking is like, 
two hundred thousand dollars or something extremely low the fact the order of magnitude that he's trying to produce because he wants to produce them in mass they walk into a tent and there's 12 of these engines there and like yeah these are the version ones we've got the version two coming out soon that's more streamlined and like he's like a year old it's just yeah. a year old and already like but he is this is a guy that's you know there are three quarters of a million tesla cars on the road and this is a guy that learned hard lessons about this and now he's applying it to rocket engines because this scale is it's not like i'm gonna build one starship and it'll be cool yeah. it's like uh the other thing to think about too is do you know how many times the space shuttle uh went into orbit with uh uncrewed so we could test it correct zero zero never always tested with people on board because you couldn't test it any other way and out of like 138 launches we had two were fatal yeah so better better we're blowing these things up in south texas than uh you yeah. know when when something else is gonna or, or or at least you know not to put a value judgment on uh it, it, uh certainly less risky is blowing up you know it, it's just money all that's happening is money is blowing up private money. and it, it, private money that that not only that is uh, again house money because these are profits yeah. that have already made on previous crazy bets that have already paid off uh yeah uh, look at starlink and the the have you seen the download speeds right now and where yeah, that's pretty headed? pretty dank how many uh how many yeah. units are up there in starlink now are we in, oh, into the know. thousands thousand? at this point? I think so. Let's I mean, see, we're, we're talking about in, in previous iterations, satellite internet, like you were lucky to get like a heartbeat, right? It was yeah. like 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 one fifty six k or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you, like the, you guys want to play a game? I've got a Motley Fool article here from uh, three days ago. Oh, that's great. Okay, good. Okay, How fast so, the Starlink. Yeah. The How answer fast? will shock you. Okay, okay. so here we go. Uh, we'll we'll all take our guesses, and then based on that, we'll we will admit factually whether or not we are shocked okay also up and uh, down, uh, uh, up and uh, down. Uh, also uh uh or i guess three numbers up speed down speed and then also latency because um i think i've only got download speeds okay Sorry. okay well then how about one number download, download speed. speed um 40 megabits brian says 40 megabits megabits per second 95 Justin says 95 megabits per second andrew I already know this number. Oh, okay. Uh, I, uh, I. My answer is the answer will not shock him. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've had to look on the page enough times, so I think I'm I'm spoiled as well. So earlier this week, speedtest.net reported that the median internet download speeds on median of have increased by fifty percent uh, from the first quarter to ninety-seven point two megabits ah! per second. All right. That is right. slightly slower than 152 uh, megabits. You know the medium right. speed for I fixed was, broad, I was broadband. shocked that everybody was fixed on this, and the, this is a lie of a game, and everybody <laughs> already knew it. I didn't know so, it. No, no, no. That's that's so amazing, though. Let, let's get into the big issue was is latency, right? And the big deal was the problem, like, how to be a tech investor. Study things so that when people hop on CNBC and start talking, when analysts talk about it, and you realize they're idiots and they don't understand what they're talking about, because like, oh, we'll start with this. Like, well, the problem with satellite internet is the latency issues. Like, well, they're low Earth orbit. Well, the problem with satellites is this. So if you have like, it goes like HughesNet and Viasat, those things are out there and like, like geosynchronous, they're much farther out orbits, right? Some are like their orbital paths are like extremely out there. And 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 Late to, to put it in perspective, I mean, this goes all the way back to when I was in college, and and I was one of the very first uh, uh, customers of uh, uh, before it was even called HughesNet. I think it was called Direct PC or something. But we, you know, propped up on a couple of um, uh, 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 cinder blocks. We would find the signal on there, and we were able to get 1.5 megabits download, but like two seconds of lag gotcha. so so it was utterly unplayable for any kind of like gaming. online yeah. gaming or any of that stuff so HughesNet, like their latency is 724 milliseconds so almost like a second you know 724 milliseconds to this okay which which, which in video game terms um if you, if you want to be competitive in overwatch you should probably be around 20 milliseconds give or take uh, yeah. uh, if you are on a dial-up modem, a hundred to two hundred milliseconds. Yeah, this is seven hundred milliseconds. Yeah. So, yeah. so Starlink, Starlink is getting. They think they're going to improve the latency even more as they put more satellites up. Zeta. Right now, it's forty-five milliseconds. 
That's not bad. I play. Yeah. I I uh, whatever. I played that Hearthstone for a dollar. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah. that's that's for for all but the super fast Twitch like FPS kind of stuff. Then you're you're pretty much good to go. Yeah, like, even for video games. Yeah, like if you're just you know getting you know a, a multiplayer for information for anything other you, than like COD I, or Overwatch or anything. To, to the best of my understanding, we're if you're talking about like a web surfing experience, you're probably roughly at like a Holiday Inn Express give or take, uh, as far as latency, uh, 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 band bandwidth, you know, being different where it's like, you know, uh, uh you're not going to have to wait for a movie to buffer or anything, but, but if you're just jumping page to page, but to also page, like we're, we're talking about, this is like in the middle of Joshua tree. Oh yeah. 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 Like, like that's, Look, like, no, no, yeah. no, no, I, I, I don't mean to take anything no, 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 away I know, from, I know, from but how I, I just, I just is. want to just yeah. again, like let's, let's highlight the fact that, uh, this uh, is anywhere. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you're not like, you know, uh, it, in, in a world where now 5G has gotten so good that you're able to sort of propagate that without having like set wires and everything. Like if, if, if satellite internet is good, it's good. Yipes, stripes. That is, I mean, we've got Andrew and I have been talking about like WiMAX and, and the future of internet connectivity for forever. I mean, and like this, this is the closest that we have, that we have gotten to any kind of world where, you know, you don't have to deal with, these like weird monopolistic deals that are made between telcos and cities and, and counties uh, to get internet everywhere. Well, the, the, the challenge is going to be, I don't know if there really is a path forward to do like, I think they think their max amount of people they'd be able to handle the United States to be 30 million. Mm. Um, just because it's just their you know, their goal. And, and I read a really interesting article too, that talked about like, there is this like every 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 bill you pay for internet service. There's a tax. There's like a fee that goes on there to provide internet for like rural services and stuff. And this is now in the billions of dollars that's there. Yeah. And that part of the play that's, that SpaceX may be doing a Starlink is that they're they've already bid on providing internet service to a number of these communities that don't have it. And that's when there's a trade-off. People point out like you know these all these satellites up there. It make it's it can be bad for certain astronomical observations. That is true. But there's also like children out there in Indian reservations and places that don't have access to internet because it's too costly and they can't bring it out there that all of a sudden are getting really cool video conferencing, et cetera, like this. And so it's like there is there's, there's a, there a is a yeah. And and, and so, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. I have a very important question to ask that might involve me just trying to sign up for Starlink in the next five seconds. If there's only thirty million people that are gonna be able to use it, should I get an account like now? Yeah, I would. Okay. I mean, uh, well, I, I, I don't know. How much time do you plan to spend outside of a 5G network? How much would I be a pouting-ass sad boy if I wanted to spend a bunch of time outside of a network and I didn't have Starlink? Yeah, but you won't want to. Also, that, that trade-off of, of, let's say the visual noise is, is 100 times worse than we'd imagine. Just you look up at the sky and it's nothing but looks like highway lights going to and fro or whatever. Uh, the trade-off is the entire planet now has access to the greatest space telescope ever created, you know, and it's like uh, all of us can be astronomers now, whether or not we have a piece of, you know, glass in our Damn. backyard or whatever. By the way, Starlink, I literally just entered my home address and it just is a page with a big Apple pay button, like right there. So slick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just saying. I appreciate I appreciate easy ways for me to get things I want. I won't buy it. Right you know, now. it's easy, and you can get what you want. Yeah, is if you consider supporting weird things. Patreon.com slash weird things is where you go if you want to make sure that I can uh, buy my unnecessary Starlink. Uh, uh, I won't be able to do it unless you pay us money directly at Patreon.com slash weird things. Make sure that we keep coming in here each and every week, except for last week when I wasn't here. But uh, except for we still showed up, didn't we? You guys did. Yeah. You want to know what? And that's that's what matters because everybody is committed to bringing you this show each and every week. Also, uh, patrons get the after show after things uh, before anybody else. So head on over there right now. Patreon.com slash weird things. Yep. Andrew, before we go any further, uh, 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 were, were we going to do a Nelson laugh at Boeing? Can we do a Nelson laugh at Boeing? I you can. I I just feel sad. Boeing. I, I, uh, go ahead, tell them. I mean, our, our our official position is that we don't like laughing at anyone's failures when it comes to trying to make it in space. Uh, however, and our tax dollars. Having said that, um, 
if we did have an acerbic part of our brain, it might right about now. Ryan, you could just. <laughs> Boeing is grounding Starliner indefinitely until they figure out a valve issue. Uh, uh, Andrew, can you put into context what Starliner was supposed to be for Boeing? So NASA, uh, NASA, when they wanted to bring back, you know, right now, NASA, since the retirement of the space shuttle, we had been dependent upon the Russians to deliver astronauts to the International Space Station, which it was helpful in the interim, and it's nice to have access that way, but you're really not the optimum way to get your astronauts up there. You want to have multiple ways, not just a shuttle or Soyuz, whatever. So NASA had created this, said, okay, this was a really brilliant plan. Uh, both uh, Bush and Obama era was the idea of, let's have NASA, instead of saying, just specifying what vehicle it has to be and designing the rocket, doing anything else like they are doing at the SLS, just say, we will pay you a price to deliver astronauts to the space station. We don't care how you do it. Well, within these parameters, you know, basically, no, don't put them in a cannon and launch them at it. Okay, there are the parameters to do this. Boeing had campaigned heavily that it should only be one company. They should they should fund only a single company, i.e. Boeing. Boeing had campaigned, had lobbied. You can go back and do a Google News search for this, and you'll even see senators saying, oh, it's a horrible idea to go on Untrusted. We should just go with the, the best contractor, uh -huh, Boeing, et cetera, okay? So that's part, it's hard to feel too bad when they had campaigned so heavily in Trash Talk SpaceX about when NASA said, no, we're going to go for multiple bids. And they had multiple bidders in there. There were you know, SpaceX, there were other companies that wanted to go bid it. Boeing and SpaceX both won contracts to send astronauts to the space station. They have to do qualifying missions to do this first. SpaceX built Crew Dragon. Boeing built Starliner, which is going, which, you know, goes atop like an Atlas rocket. And there was this debate, who is going to be first? Who is going to be the first to send astronauts? This Because a big deal was the bringing back this flag that we took in from the space station when we had the last shuttle mission there, and they're like, to return the flag was going to be this big thing. And I remember, you know, three, four years ago, like, will Boeing do it first or will SpaceX? And, you know, Boeing's dependable and has been doing this for years. As you all know, SpaceX has been going to the International Space Station since last year. Boeing had to do a qualifying mission, an unmanned qualifying mission with Starliner, which was going to do an intercept and a dock with the space station. They went to go do this last year, well after SpaceX had already been putting people, on, you know, had, had passed its qualifying. Boeing Starliner goes up. They had a mechanical malfunction, and it wasn't behaving the way it was supposed to do, and they had to bring it back down, which was a big error. Boeing was like, oh, well, you know, we think we know what the error is. We think we're good. Let's go ahead and move to the part where we put astronauts up there Whoa. and go to the International Space Station. And NASA's like, that's a horrible idea. Yeah. And we we give you a lot of credit for, you know, we'll go, we go a long ways, but no, you got to do this qualifying mission again before we put astronauts on there. So this last past week ago was going to be the qualifying where they're actually going to try to orbit and go to the ISS. Well... It never left the launch pad. They had to add a little bit of delay because of the whole NACA debacle, which we'll get into in a second because an update on that. And so they had a you know, the little delay, and then they were doing some sort of checks. And they're like, huh, we're having some sort of, we're getting some mechanical error. And like, what do we have to do? Like, well, maybe we have to pull it back into the assembly, the you know, vehicle assembly building. They pull it in the vehicle assembly building to check it. They're like, no, we got to take this off the rocket. This is, we've got 12 valves, and some of them are still stuck, and we don't know why they're stuck. And now they're like, we've got to bring this thing back into the factory. And wow. now they're saying, we don't know when. We're like, well, oh, it'd be, they're like, we'll be, it'd be fantastic if we launched this year, which means they ain't launching this year. Wow. I joked that Starliner was going to have its first successful orbital mission before. I mean, I joked that Starship would have a yes. first successful orbital mission than Starliner. Now it looks like that might actually be a real thing. Hey, uh, do you guys remember that last scene from Unbreakable when uh, 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 Samuel L. Jackson says, now that I know who you are, I know who I am? Yeah. Uh, new sentence. You ever, you ever been to a Harlem Globetrotters show? Uh, <laughs> a show? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. I mean, they played the someone. The Washington Generals? The Generals. Oh, that's right. I, yeah. I, I wonder what... Uh, I'm glad that the generals keep showing up for those shows. Cause otherwise I wouldn't know what I was watching. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> and meantime, uh, totally unrelated, uh, but uh, Blue Origin is filed lawsuit a lawsuit to, against NASA today because of the they oh, tell us the, the the lunar system because because, sounds, because, because the their game. name sounds too much like nassholes and that's <laughs> and they want to be the assholes of space. So wow, that was okay. The, so this was... is yeah, this is a big a big a big contract <laughs> dispute that uh, uh, a Blue Origin had teamed with another company and and spacex got it it, it it went back under review right and then spacex got it again and now now blue Origin origin suing so there was this contract to return american uh, return americans to the, the moon and that, again nasa said let's do the thing we did with the crew the the whole crew thing because they're like now it's like this worked out really great with one company yeah uh let's go do this again we'll ask a bunch of companies and they were they had said in the contract depending upon funding we might fund multiple companies so there were three funds that came three plans came in one was spacex then there was blue origin and then there was uh Dynamics, uh which i never pronounced the name wrong and they did their evaluations of it and if you didn't even look at the price spacex had the best evaluation yeah, you know, because they've been working with NASA's like their relationship with NASA has grown considerably. You know, there have been SpaceX is open about how much they've learned from NASA. NASA's learned to sort of adopt to sort of like kind of SpaceX's way of doing things and sees as there's some efficiencies there. There are people that work back and forth between there. It's really, really evolved as since we've been doing this podcast, watching the evolution. That's been great. Blue Origin had teamed with like Northrop Grumman and some other company. I think North, like so, like Lockheed, several companies to build. They were calling it the national team. They called themselves the national team, and they had their plan to do it, which looked like uh, a little janky to me. What they're doing, like they had this lander, and there are these like these davits, like my dad uses for his you know his bass boat, you know, to to lower equipment down there, whatever. But that wasn't the problem. So like uh, NASA said, we we don't think this think proposal is going to work as the way it is it seems like it's not the right proposals they rejected they they rejected blue origins they rejected the dynex one they accepted spacex and they only had money they didn't even have money to fund the other ones you know that yeah. was part of the problem too and they also they went to spacex like can we like do a deferred payment or something too with you and they're like yes so blue origin lost it they're like no it's not fair first thing they did is they protested nasa nasa said Nope, this is consistent. This is what we have. This is why we came to this evaluations. We stand by this. Then they approached, they went to the government accounting office, which is who oversees things in government. If you say, hey, this is not handled right, this is unfair, like contracting, whatever, it's their job to say, yeah, no, this is the way it's supposed to be. The GAO looked at it and said, nope, this looks consistent to us. We think NASA handled this right. Everything said, there's there's no reason for protest, whatever. So, of course, Blue Origin's like, all right, guys, let's back to the drawing board. Let's just build some stuff. Nope. They said, let's sue NASA. We're so suing NASA. There's... I mean, I, I, and, and while we're on the topic of legal actions, uh, I'm, I'm seeing here more bad news for Boeing. Uh, it, apparently being sued by uh, Rudy Rudiger for uh, gimmick infringement, saying, <laughs> like, like, we're supposed to be the last place, kids. <laughs> it's a sports movie. Okay. The last place, kids? Yeah. Oh. No. I've never seen it. Rudy. Oh. I've never heard the of the sh the movie Rudy, right? Movie Rudy. That guy, Rudy Rudiger. Yeah, but he eventually got on the field. Uh, yeah, yeah. Had a shout at Rudy. It was like right. Rudy. But 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 meanwhile, he was last place the entire time. He was okay. And he's, All right. Well, he's, so there's hope. Feeling like Brian he's feeling says there's hope for there's Blue hope Origin. For there's, Blue hope. Origin. There's, there's hope. Origin. There's hope for Blue Origin. <laughs> it's like, were uh, you literally just looking up his last name? Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, in fact i would love to believe i want to see the movie of this where it's just like okay here's what we do we take your ship ula and we're gonna duct tape it to one blue origin yeah. <laughs> one spacex and we're just just for grins flying circles around it will be sir richard branson <laughs> yeah and, and we're so it, it you going. went to space blue, and, and blue origin is like incredibly talented engineers yeah. and some of the hardware they built is is amazing and and what they've done it's just the time frame and the problem is now they've been doing these infographics uh they've done this infographic war which like i've got i've got a blue origin hat here like i've been rooting for these people too but you, when you see them do these infographics of like show the infographic price again uh immensely complex complex and high risk is this highlighted orange i just ordered a t-shirt 
that says that because I thought that was hilarious. That's yeah. what they call the SpaceX thing. And so there's some like space fan sites that started selling these T-shirts that have that, you know, that say that because immensely like, complex and a high risk. They put the the height of the vehicle on here as if having a smaller ship is worse. <laughs> I guess it's it's a weird argument to make. You know, why would I want this big, large one? I'm happy with this small one. Why would I want the one that's been tested and launched more times than not? Because um, right. So, so which is the larger one? The yeah, SpaceX sorry. Starship. Who's who's the good guy? Which one's Rudy? So yeah, the red and, and red Elon is or, so red red is SpaceX. It. Yeah, and so it's a larger ship. And also, we're talking about just the lander, right? Like. Right. That, that's what they were bidding on for the, for the lunar mission, just the lander. I assume so. No, and that I mean, yeah, they yeah, it's they would the land the whole starship. The Orion. Yeah, yeah. So the the idea is that that this thing would go would go into lunar orbit, and then they would use like they would use SLS to send astronauts on Orion to intercept with the lander and then land. Which sounds and it's like. SpaceX is kind of like, like, Leon, could you take them all away? It's like, well, yeah, but it's the whole, it's the name of the game. Yeah. Um, so read, read the description here and tell me if this makes you think it's bad idea or good idea. All right. So Lunar Starship, immensely complex and high risk. There's an unprecedented number of technologies, development, and operations that have never been done before for Starship to land on the moon. This includes de- yes. <laughs> this includes oh, developing super heavy, not only the largest launch vehicle stage ever produced, <laughs> but also yeah. one oh, yeah. that has it's to like, be it's reusable. Like, it's like it, uh, it, it, not only is it the most uh, amazing pinnacle of human engineering <laughs> achievement, but it it have but to be reusable. even cooler. Exactly. Yeah. It's got a Man. racing stripe too. The Man. waist. My ex girlfriend, such a bitch. Yeah. She <laughs> apparently is into guys who are rich and handsome and, and hey. really, really self confident and drive cool cars. Here's some facts. Look how symmetrical the pecs are <laughs> on this <laughs> on this spaceship. What a jerk. Am I right? <laughs> what naturally enchanting eyes on my ex girlfriend. His new boyfriend. You know his dad only married his mom because she was hot, right? <laughs> so uh, it's that first. Oh, I'm ruined for SpaceX. This sounds really cool. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. That's anyway. Good. What you really want is a very tiny wiener. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is an immense cell phone. That is an immensely complex and high risk cell phone by Blue Origin to put that out into the world. Because cause the, the crux of the argument that they get into is, well, they've never used the site. They have to do a bunch of things flawlessly in a row. But, like, that's also, that's always been the, okay, like, the, uh, that's the part that what goes with do. it. Okay. That's with all it. Right, yeah. all right, all right, uh, uh, for everybody who doesn't have video, we're looking at the infographic that has a measuring of two penises. <laughs> One is 32 feet long. The other is 126. The bulk of the article is about how huge, complex, and high risk the big one is. And... But but what you really want is safe, low risk, and fast. Mm-mm. Just get get in, get out. Just just. Hey, I went to the moon. Uh, you know how so you Bryce, can do things if, if, safe if, 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 and low risk and fast. Bryce, if you're still looking for a dating profile, log on. <laughs> safe, safe, low, low risk, risk, and, and fast. fast. <laughs> Look, read the uh, read the read the paragraph below the description for that. Sure. The <laughs> national team's architecture only requires three launches and okay, yeah. flexible. If you're not even gonna use the name of your own company but instead call yourself the national but that's that's the proper name for it all right all right yeah yeah, yeah. uh the national team's architecture only requires three launches and is flexible to fly in multiple existing launch vehicles with far fewer in-space rendezvous further the system is entirely built on heritage systems and proven technologies that are flying today it goes on to say it liked you even when your hair was dumb and you (laughs) were just developing so and i that last part that are flying today remind me what landing system is any of the partners of yeah. Blue Origin using that's able to do that? You know, uh, it's um, called I mean, Amazon garbage, Delivery, my can. friend. That, 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 <laughs> that, that's I mean, called. Have, have, I mean, I mean, New Shepard. I mean, New Shepard is a is a rocket lander system yeah. thing. So, but it's like like they've never. <sighs> You know, I I do wonder. I want to like I, these guys. I, I think that, that I want to root for them. That is for the contractor audience. 
idiots, right? Or or, or the 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 people, the, the the decision makers that are. This is for Senate. Yeah, it's for the Senate. Yeah, it's 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 to give people, you know, talking points uh, and 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 to to do things that that would scare them, but. Yikes, stripes, man. I, I don't know. Uh, look, uh, obviously, we we are we 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 find ourselves very often uh, kind of playing cheerleader for SpaceX. But look, when they when they when they when they when when they march on on Washington, their cheer is going to be safe, low risk, <laughs> and fast. What do we want it? We already got it. Safe, low, low risk, risk, and fast. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. There is, there's a lot of other players out there. If you look up, uh, take a look at, we've talked about Rocket Lab before. They've been doing, they've got really cool engine designs too, with because they were using these smaller stage ones using electrically powered turbo pumps. Relativity Space is another one. Um, they're looking at a whole pipeline of manufacturing stuff using 3D manufacturing. And this is a number of former SpaceX people are working for Relativity Space. There's a lot of excitement there. And if you go to, if you read the uh, the SpaceX boards, people are very encouraging about this. They're very the the bad blood with Blue Origin kind of goes a little bit deep because of uh, Blue Origin had tried to basically had filed a patent for landing on a barge and like let's you know let threaten you to see a SpaceX. Yeah, and also on the whole suing NASA <clears throat> thing, SpaceX had filed SpaceX to get their. Uh, their commercial off the cots, the commercial off the shelf program for for sending supplies to the International Space Station, SpaceX had to sue in order to have that contact yeah. that that contract opened up for other bidders. But again, the, their point was NASA didn't even open this up for bid. Yeah, and I, 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 NASA I think open up for there 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 is something to be said about when you're dealing specifically with the government suing is not necessarily like me suing Brian because he didn't, you know, pay me back for, for, you know, torchies or whatever. Yeah, like, you know why? Because I'm safe, low risk <laughs> and fast. fast. Uh, like, like that often is like people inside the government, like entity will tell you, you have to sue us. So these things, these like gears can start turning and, and things can, can get moving. So uh, the, the thing that's odd about the blue origin thing is that it comes after, not one, but two formal appeals uh, uh, to not only NASA, but also the government accounting office. So um, that, that, that is kind of what makes that interesting in a way that, uh, you know, if, if they were just suing them for a, a, a general bidding issue, uh, it would be a bit of a different story. Which, If you take a look to a relativity space, go take a look at the rockets and you'll see you know, proof that people probably think SpaceX is on the right path is if you go look at, you scroll down and you look at the Terran R. Yeah. And that looks Grid like fins. a SpaceX rocket. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, like, the, the, that's always yeah. been the, um, the, the, the hope is that whenever anything succeeds, that's, you know, carving a pathword forward, uh, a pathway forward so you can uh, uh, replicate it. Like, now you just know, okay, well, this works. How can we make it even better? And that's, that's really where progress comes from. Go to, and now go to uh, Rocket Labs and click on Rockets. Click on the Neutron. I'm going to go. We're taking a look. We're gonna, oh, look. It's the same, it's the same rocket. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's amazing. The more people that can be making it, the, the, better, the better we're going to be. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, and, it, and it's not like, Does oh, that have an Apple Pay button like, on it, too? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, there's only, if you're, trying to go for reusability and you're looking for rocket designs there's only so many designs that make sense but it is it's just <sighs> Blue origin we love you this is a plea just just get it's, your just get your stuff ready to go i mean look get, uh, yeah. i don't know about you guys but when i have a budget and i have a i have a a, 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 a command a, 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 a mandate to go spend this money what i want to go with first is whoever is complaining the loudest about how unfair things are. Like people who are investing all their time and energy and effort into infographics do, about do be, how. To be fair, I think if you are the national team and you have spent this much time making that much money by, by uh, government contracts, complaining for long enough, you know, depending on what seems but, to have worked. All right, but on, on what the mood is in Washington, and exactly where the budgets are, and what what is left over where, and whether or not there's a big spending bill that is that is coming through. I think their goal, from how I understand the situation, is just to stay in the game 
long enough that eventually uh, uh, the powers that be say, well, we should fund two like companies that that we we you know SpaceX can have their contract. <laughs> we just also want our contract. And that was, if I remember the initial dispute, that was part of it was that they they were like, well, even if you can't pay us all, we know you're NASA. Eventually, you're gonna find more money. <laughs> I I would love if like they did another second contract and Elon pulled like Nolan Bushnell did with like Kai's like video games and like, Oh, we've got a new bidder from like a uh, Milan Usk who <laughs> is uh they've got a reliable looking rocket system there. They, this hardware, these engines are great. It's tested. So we're awarding two contracts. Exactly. Space and just, Z. Oh, and they're right across the street. <laughs> he, he, when he was facing when Elon, Oh, excuse me. When uh, Nolan Bushnell with Atari was facing problems, some areas where they had to have, like they demanded to have like two competitors to be able to bid on stuff. This video game company called like was keys, which did like centipede and other stuff popped out of nowhere. And they were putting out really good titles. Nolan Bushnell literally took some of the best Atari engineers out of the Atari in the middle of the night, created an entirely separate video game company so he could compete from two different companies to get these contracts. And if you looked up the corporate like address, it was his next door neighbor's mailbox. <laughs> so it was just uh, brilliant, brilliant. That's amazing. And we got awesome games. Uh, I have one, one more thing I want to show you. Uh, man, I, we, got, we got to do this too. Russia is bl I got two things I got to show you. I apologize. Russia, Russia has said they found the problem of why there was that hole. Remember the hole they found drilled inside of the uh, inside of the space station? Yeah, the big mystery hole. Yeah, Russia says we solved the mystery. We we figured it out. What was it? They're blaming an American astronaut. They're blaming to the saying that she was having some you know health issues and she wanted to get off. So they think that oh she 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 drilled the hole. Like it is the most crazy thing possible. <clears throat> The Russians are, because yeah, the Russians yeah. are like... Welcome to press conference. Everything makes sense very shortly. Think about woman. A eh? woman. <laughs> uh, lunar cycle in space. Very close to the moon. Moon every 90 minutes. Yeah, go little woman. Woman like go home. <laughs> Drill so hole. They, they, they have the most idiotic explanation for why this would happen. Is they say, hey, listen, if it happened on the... If it was drilled on the ground, it would by space it would have had a pressure issue, whatever. We would have known. And and while every other everybody else is like, no, we think one of your technicians drilled it on the ground and then super glued it shut. Yeah. And then that plug eventually broke and went, you know, that's where the leak happened. So the Russians were like, if it happened, if this drill happened on the ground, then there's no way this had to have happened in space. It's like, no, you're forgetting the most obvious explanation. That's so, insane. So in 2018. Uh, a, a, a female astronaut had an emotional breakdown in space and then damaged the Russian Soyuz spacecraft that was docked at the station so she could return to Earth early. That is just really out of pocket. Yeah, you know, in Russia, we have saying, no fine super glue bit uh, must be woman having fit. <laughs> is old saying we have. Babushka. <laughs> <laughs> it is between the Naka uh, debacle um, and this. Like, I don't know if this is just coverage for the fact that they just are in a very, very embarrassing state. Um, but I, there's an article that, like, I every time something was happening, I didn't want to like post it because I don't want to be mean because I really think there's a lot of amazing stuff that's happened. You know, the Russian Space Initiative, and yeah, I think they're really capable people. They're very underfunded, but the politics of this is just nuts. But I sent Bryce this article that I think kind of explains everything. I think we talked about this before. Um, with, with, with the Russian space program? Yes, yes. We'll see if we pull this up there, because this, this traces back to the original problem. I think we mentioned this on the last one. You weren't here, Justin. Uh, no, the other one, the, uh, the Russian. I just sent it to you. Yeah, the, uh, the Onion headline. This was. In from the meantime, years we ago. go back to the live press conference with Russia. <laughs> you, you, you hear about the American space pen, <laughs> right upside down, zero G. In Russia, we use pencil. Ah. Hey, what, what do you do also when the graphite? No, no, no. What do you do when the graphite breaks off the edge of the pencil and it floats around and gets in your eye? Uh, what do you do when your mother cries about what embarrassment you are? American piece that's, of garbage. That's, 
that's what I always hated about that. Oh, the Russian is you see, they use a pencil. Like, ha ha, we saw the pencil. Like, yeah, no, we used a space pen, so the little bits of a pencil didn't break off. You need to have shavings. Also, I believe I, be I believe the story goes that the Russians didn't even use a pencil for that exact reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd probably use what it would, you would have used like a crayon. Like, that like was a grease thing. pen or something. Yeah. yeah. And I've had people tell that story, like, this is in Judah. And I'd be like, um, you know, the problem in space is... Uh, so this is the Onion headline. Russian scientists announced six-month delay in carving new space station. <laughs> this is from 1998. Show the photo at the bottom. Just It's just it's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like an, an artisanal wood shaver who is uh, creating the new space station. Look at Found it. There's a drill. There's the drill. <laughs> yeah, we got him. Got his yeah. ass. Uh, why do we want to go to space? Bryce, show some video from Skylab. We forget Skylab kind of gets memory hold. Skylab was awesome. Skylab was this, you know, the latter, later stages of the Saturn program when we had the super heavy lift, when we could, uh, when we had a really heavy lift thing. This is what you could do in Skylab. Wow, that's great. And so we're, we're looking we're, at the interior of the thing, which is much, much wider than this space inside of the space station or the space shuttle. You're watching people do these acrobatics and floating around inside of there. The uh, starships can have a much larger diameter. There's a crazy, I think we'll see there, we'll see the guy running. He's running. Yeah. And so he's, because, he's doing the, like, the, 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 the 2001 A Space exactly, Odyssey yeah. thing. Yeah. I believe that's, it, that's where the inspiration came from. Yeah. Uh, also, a, a, a friend of the show, Richard Garriott, his dad, I believe, was uh, served on uh, Skylab. That's awesome. Yeah, just so much interior space. I'm mean, again using wide angle, but you look up, they're able to do so much more acrobatics. The running was cool because it wasn't like in 2001 where they spun it. It's just because as you move forward, yep, you're you're basically your momentum takes you straight, but you're because of the curvature of the spacecraft. Yeah, and like I'd never seen that before. I'd never seen somebody actually running in zero g. That's awesome. Well, uh, uh, you know, maybe happy days are here again when uh, yep. when Starship goes up. Shirtless guy in their boxer shorts, drifting around in zero yep. gravity. Yeah, provided Safe. no crazy ladies with drills show up. Eh? <laughs> no, just yeah. a, crazy just a, women just a with the moon. Low risk and fast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, see, that's why tiny ship is better. You guys ready for picks? Yep. <laughs> um... Uh, uh, so uh, Lower Decks is back, and it's good. It's fun. It's it's joyful. It's fast paced. It, it love the first season. Doesn't mess around. Uh, I I really enjoyed episode one of season two. I thought it was quite good. I'm looking for yeah. I really love first season. I really I had so much, it was my favorite Star Trek thing in forever. Um, I, I wasn't here last week, but I did watch uh, the Suicide Squad, and I like the Suicide Squad quite a bit. I thought it was. Uh, you know, I, I, James Gunn uh, with the the second Guardians was, I think, a little bit more uh, too much shot, reverse shot, talking in a place. A little less of what makes James Gunn, uh, I think, a really d uh, amazing dynamic director of yeah, but big that, creative. They, 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 uh, when it comes to tossing a ball back and forth, oh man, did yeah. they deliver? I mean, look, and, and so I don't want to, I don't want to make this a a slam on <laughs> Guardians too, but I, I, I do think that with Suicide Squad, it kind of gets back to what you know got James Gunn the the job for for Guardians of the Galaxy and and what made Guardians. Uh, a, a special uh, with the added thing that with the the clout he had coming out of the controversy, he obviously was just able to really push the limit on violence because this is a a fairly graphic uh, uh, movie when it comes to that. Uh, but I had a I, I had a, a I had a good time with it, and it was it was consistently a movie that was ahead of where I I expected it to be, and it was it was fun and creative and exciting. And John Cena is great. Uh, I got a pick. Uh, you know, con continuing off of last week, I, I think I I, um, I I tentatively made this my pick, and I think I I'm feeling good about it. Last week, I had started binging, catching up for the White Lotus. Ooh, that's on, on my HBO. list. I've heard it's good. I think that it's very good. Uh, the thing I was concerned about last week was I watched episode one, and and it, they they kind of set up this murder mystery. You know, somebody dies from the outset. Um, and then who is it? And and I kept watching that first episode with it with that very like Sherlock Holmes kind of of perspective of like oh he really wants this this uh, this room with all these private features. Oh does he want to do that? Oh this family is like has 
kind of got a weird dynamic. Oh, this this one lady is, is a little off. Um, and and I think last week when I talked about this, Brian, you asked what would be the best version of the show. What would the best version of the show look like? And I think I said to to be surprised that it is a murder mystery. And I think that it is. Nice. I think that it came around to it. Like it was a. Th I haven't had this in a while, but like me and and some friends in on online like kind of tried to watch it together. We were all like taking bets on who the person who died is. Uh, I won, by the way. I nice. nailed it correctly. And um, and and along the way, you have I think a very interesting um, uh, a satire of of people with privilege and. Um, and a an examination of of what type of problems and and conflicts that they both are involved in and generate. I I think that this is, this is kind of a special little show. It's only six episodes. They're all out now um, on HBO. But I I I think if if you want to see a lot of 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 bad kind of cartoonish characters kind of get what's theirs. Um, I think the White Lotus you, you you might be into, and this is a uh, uh, one of those great HBO shows where like every actor or every role is filled by a really good actor and often a really good character actor. Like just looking at the cast, it's like all right, there there's some there's some killers on here. Yeah, I think uh, the the most inspired um, casting uh, out of everybody is um, Molly Shannon is is in a few episodes, and uh, she's perfect. She's pitch perfect for the. Um, the the character that yeah, she is. Yeah, because it's like, what, Alexandra Daddario, Jennifer Coolidge, of course, uh, Stifler's mom, who's got it going on, uh, 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 Connie Britton from Friday Night Lights, and Steve Zahn, who has Steve been Zahn, yeah. criminally, criminally underrated his entire career. Just just an awesome actor. Yeah, so uh, I, that's The White Lotus. I, I think it kind of stuck the landing in, in a really good way. It's not a whodunit, but it's a who got got. So and is I this, think is that's this another one of these things yeah. that HBO has been doing where it's like really just one season like this uh supposedly this was conceptualized because they shot it during covid so they could rent out the four seasons and shoot it safely you. in hawaii that but they just uh, uh last week said hey we're gonna make a season two it'll be in a different place with a different cast okay which is also so great be in its own, its own <laughs> with, the, with a new feature we like to call outdoors <laughs> yes. where, where other humans will be walking yeah. around but it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of interesting from the dna of the show because it, it makes it so that anyone who's not on the on the resort doesn't exist. You know, yeah. there's a character in the first episode who you don't see anymore because she has to leave the resort and she, for, for good reason. But then she never gets there's no follow up. There's not even like, I wonder what happened. In the, it's yeah. just yeah, this you person don't, you, doesn't you don't, exist. You don't, you don't smash cut to Milwaukee where she's getting off the plane. Like right. if, if she's out of the resort, if anyone's off the resort, then they're gone from this universe and and it's 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 really interesting it's it's also uh created and written by mike white i did not yeah. know the name but uh oh really uh yes who i believe was known for oh he wrote school of rock um but he also did enlightened for hbo a few years back as well um so uh yeah no mike white great 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 writer he wrote uh orange county which is one of which was uh, an underrated movie yeah. uh, so that's my pick the white lotus on hbo andrew you're, you muted yourself. Muted. Check out. Uh, I was going. It's funny because I tell him going. Yeah, he did. He did School of Rock. Yeah. You know, he did Chuck and Buck and all that. And I realize I'm muted. It doesn't matter. Um, the uh, the Everty Astronaut Tim Dodd, his YouTube channel. Uh, those interviews with Elon Musk are phenomenal. And I think if you like them, consider supporting his Patreon. Like this is what you know, was mentioned before was pre YouTube. Yeah, you would get 60 minutes would be there for eight minutes and you would get stupid questions because the producers would be like, well, it's space stuff. People don't understand it. We got it. You'd be like, all right, that's cool. Here, just in-depth nerds nerding out over space stuff and watching, you know, two and a half hours of this is like amazing, you know. And so just more. like spot spot checking it through here, showing it on the show, like it looks very um, – it does not look very edited much at all. It seems very oh. like stream of consciousness. This was the couple of hours I spent with Elon. Yeah, it literally, there is no editing as far as I can. I mean, it's just straight on through. Like, let's just go through here and follow him through as he does the tour, which I love. Smart. And like, how, how would this exist any, in any other medium? Wouldn't. Wouldn't. They, would, they, they would edit it down. They'd tack another uh, uh, interview on top of it. And then that, all that. And then Neil deGrasse would, Tyson would show up and be all like, "Space is so big." Need Justice Bolo tie. <laughs> Stopped dreaming though. 
I can't wait. I've got <laughs> no, didn't, didn't we figure out that that we're like the, like next to the ten year anniversary if we stop dreaming? That's right. <laughs> oh, oh, hashtag I'm never throw, forget. I'm going to throw a dreamer party. Yeah, I, hope, <laughs> I believe that was March 2012. So I think we're, we're looking for next year. Ooh, I'm so I'm so baby. in for just 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 a crow a crow fest 2022. Just one of them. <laughs> a, 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 a takes so cold it can only <laughs> exist in space. <laughs> oh my god i just want nothing but this amazing montage of all the spacex stuff over with with ascendant music and his voice we stopped dreaming yeah <laughs> <laughs> we stopped reaching for the stars gentlemen yep it's been weird very yeah. cool like a reverse Carl Sagan. <laughs> <laughs> a reverse Carl Sagan. Alrighty, well, we'll take a few minutes here and get ready for after things. Yep. Uh, so if you need to go and take a break, whatever, do that now, please. <laughs> hey, Justin. What's up, fam? How's it going, man? What's up? What's what's popping? Uh, glad to have you back. I'm glad to be back, man. I I I, uh, I didn't realize how much uh, uh, I'd be refreshed by a few days away. Actually, kind of like taking time uh, to just sort of f around. Yeah. Um, but like like all the best, you know, time away. I came back just like all these ideas, man. I got, ah. I got crackling ideas. I actually got to talk to you, okay, about uh, a, a great night idea. I feel like me and you have to do like a team building day. Okay. All right. And here's the only goal. The only goal is that we come up with like 20 new sound effects or bumpers for a great night. And we just screw around and 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 either find stuff or brainstorm or 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 BS or or record them and produce them like uh but I feel like like just just put some I mean like that would never be a thing that we could do when I was in when I was in Oakland, just be like, hey, you just want to hang out on Skype all day or whatever. But if it's us just hanging out, like we would just hang out otherwise, but just like writing down like, oh, that would be a cool thing or that'd be a funny thing. And then we just put them all together. And 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 uh, uh, I was just like, like, oh, man, that'd actually be fun. I'd actually yeah. be really excited for sound effect day. That'd be fun. Yeah, because I, I always I always get a, a hair that like, oh, I should I should add more stuff to the soundboard or. We should, uh, you know, figure out, you know, a script of something to get go get someone recorded. But then, you know, yeah, that's, but, and that's always the thing you can put off. And I'm like, like that's why it'd be it'd be fun if we just made yeah. it like a day. That'd be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually, I've got a trip coming up in September for a few days. You got what? I got a trip coming up. Oh crap! Where are you going? Uh, uh, to go see some family in. Uh, I, I, won't, I won't say, but to go see some family somewhere gotcha. in the country. Um, I uh, guess I don't know why I'm bothering the. They would not. The, those those folks. Well, wh who, where where generally are we talking about? Like a couple like states a away. Okay, yeah, a couple so states away. Yeah. Uh, let me let me let me take. This. Sure, sure, sure. But um, but yeah, that that's coming up, and so I'm looking for. Uh, uh, that'll be a fun little relaxing thing, uh, in a couple of weeks, and so, uh, and so that might mean for for. Uh, when is that? That's it's around Labor Day, I think. But um, we may have Corey fill in for weird things that day. Hey, Andrew. Hello. Uh, that's right. I'm Sorry going to space. The AC, that's okay. But it is hot, even with it on it right so, now. We gotta get you. A, we gotta get you a silent fan. We gotta get. Gotta find find you a uh, a, a fan. Well, a fan. A fan ain't gonna cut. Just something to hold you over. So. Uh, Bryce, the AC is not even cutting it right now. Okay, okay, oh, sure, sure. I go, I go as hard as I can. I take, I try to keep it off as long as I can, <laughs> as long as I can. Well, the, but the fan can supplement that. It's a two prong solution. I got, I got a Dyson right back there blowing at me. Okay, all right. Well then, I'm trying, Bryce. I... I've done everything. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you, we'll get you a, a big ice maker. You could do get a bowl of ice in front of the fan. Do that old wives' tale. How bad is the noise from this? Uh, it's it's not bad. It's it's part of, part of it is that um the uh, uh the either the opal or on the computer side it's doing a little auto docking. So sometimes when you come back, we can hear it when you if you've turned it on. Yeah. Oh. Um, but it's uh it is not the worst thing in the world. 
I'm a horrible person that wants air conditioning. <laughs> we get you uh, get you one of those um, biker jackets with the um, uh, with they've got like a radiator system, and so you pump cold water, you pump water through it, and it keeps you cool on the road, supposedly. I'm you want to be water cooled? You want to be the water cooled podcaster? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, check out on, uh, I just saw my Twitter at a little write up in the mother, uh, motherboard vice, vice motherboard. Oh, you mean this, uh, this tool lets you program an entire app with one voice command and they linked mm -hmm. to your YouTube video with code Vox. Uh -huh. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's the one. Now what is, uh, is code Vox basically, uh, the, the, um, the code decks, um, uh, system yeah. with a new UI. We had, we had like a hackathon, which was like, just build a bunch of stuff internally. It was a 24 hour. And like, I, I started on this crazy, like VR integrated codex thing. And I'm like, this is idiotic, scale it back. And then, uh, you know, one, there was like a list of suggestions. Somebody had mentioned like, oh, what about doing voice and code? And what, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've always dreamed about like doing an easy way. So I just built, I built this on top of codex in like, I mean, I added, I used, you know, the, the, the built-in browser library. I mean, it looks more complicated than it is. Like Codex just does all the really heavy lifting. I built an interface. I built a little, some prompts and stuff to work behind the scenes and some, uh, you know, interpreters that let you run the code, like Python and JavaScript in the browser. But really, like, it's Codex. Wow, you know, that's, that's what cool. I could try to show people. Be like, oh, is this going to be an app? I'm like, I made this in, like, a day. Like, it's Codex does the work. This is just some nice you know, f you know, flashy stuff around here, but like, this wasn't like, uh, oh, I built this complex. No. And like, that's. Yeah. So, Brian, did, did you see, uh, uh, any of their, their live demo for the codex stuff? Uh, no, I, I, I did not see the live stuff, but, uh, but I'm familiar with, uh, with what, it, uh, what it was. Yeah. It was pretty cool. They showed off. You, you just type in, you tell it some stuff to code and, um, it recognizes what you're talking about. It figures out how to do it. My guess is this the is code making... is probably a little inefficient, um, uh, maybe inefficient, or might be a little uh, it's the, proprietary. So this is building scene. a JavaScript game. So uh, this is Greg Brockman, is the co-founder of OpenAI. So basically, this was if you fast forward through there, you can see like building a little space game entirely by saying, "Add this as a ship. Have this happen when it collides," and it just it figures it be like it's amazing how much it can figure out how to do this. Yeah. That's Ilya and Coda and uh, Greg. Ilya is Ilya is brilliant and one of our research scientists that had research at at OpenAI. Um, so, yeah. just dudes I work with. That's all. Just you know, know some coworkers, a couple you know. of bros. Uh, um, were we going to talk about uh, crap jobs? Bad, crappy jobs in uh, in our after things? Uh, Ill Inc. Yeah, don't drink candle wax. Okay. Um, Oh yeah, please don't do that. <laughs> just, just, uh, just. Then you know, don't, don't eat, don't eat, don't eat wax is going to yeah. be our position. Uh, yeah, we uh, we want to talk about crap jobs, Andrew. For after things. Uh, yeah. Do you want to do that? Yeah, it sounds good. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm open for anything, but, but, uh, I, I certainly have no shortage of crap jobs to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll go around. We'll, 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 we'll share. Uh, all right, everybody ready to do some after things? Yeah. Ready. Andrew, how are you? I am ready. All right, then I'll catch in for after things here in three, two. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, hello. Justin Robert Young. Sup? And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Salutations, everybody. Gentlemen? Yeah. Let's talk about jobs. Bad jobs. Naughty jobs. Bad, bad, Gross bad jobs. Bad jobs. Like, like, it's it's so weird because uh, we all smiled and thought about like, oh man, yeah, I've got a story, and now here we are to the part of the show where it's like, no, let's relive those crappy jobs that we had. And then it's like, now all of a sudden it's less pleasant. <laughs> like, I'll, like, I'll start. <laughs> I, I'll start. Go ahead. I'll, I'll start. I'll start. Um, uh, I had a an internship coming out of college with uh, a um, a large there for a for a venue like in a, a coliseum arena sort of place for a few months. And I had just come out of college. I had a, 
a, deg- a fine arts degree in kinetic imaging. I know how to make videos and audio. I can use Photoshop and all that stuff. And, um, and so I spent that internship, which is probably, I would say, three, three or four months or so um, in a back closet of the like administrative office at that venue, um, going through old contracts and taking the staples out of them so that they could be digitally scanned. And that seemed to be the only job for the four people who I was working for in that office. And it wasn't until I left um, and like had as a side thing for this internship had helped make this commercial, this like PSA commercial that we talked on night attack about years ago mm-hmm. um, that, that they go, Oh, you could do, you could do stuff like that. Oh, we have a whole graphic. We have a whole team who could have, oh. <laughs> who could have used you. And that, and that was like, and, and I would like go in, I had days I'd go in and cry because that's all I was doing. I was like, Oh my God, I just came out of college and now I'm stuck here on, you know, taking staples out of old like Leonard Skinner contracts and and writers and like oh cool good good use of my time I mean also especially because couldn't couldn't you just Battlestar Galactica it and just just cut off those corners and scan them I mean uh, was, did, uh, was, mm, it, was 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 there you're gonna defile the Leonard Skinner writer? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna sell those triangles on eBay <laughs> <laughs> down the list. Skinner staples. <laughs> but it, that was like there were you know there there were you know two folks and a supervisor in that office, and it seemed like that was all that they were doing every day, and so they knew they had an intern, and I guess they just popped me in cool. there instead of like talking to me and knowing that I could help out there because yeah. they have a whole marketing pe- team. That, anyway, although I'm, that I'm that is a good. Uh, a, a good example, and this is the kind of stuff that you learn, and mm. this is this is why you know you have a an experience like this is that you know you gotta be your own biggest hype man, or at the very least you gotta sound you gotta sound the horn mm. if you believe you should be somewhere else. Like it is, it is always oh, oh, nine times out of ten, it's going to be worth it just to at least make it known and be a bit of a a, a, a squeaky wheel. Uh, in in terms of doing that, and I'm, I'm sure that mm-hmm. you know, uh, you eventually got on their radar because your talent was there. Sure. But uh, uh, you know, you you know that that's 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 a good lesson to go from. Yeah. Uh, my man, aside from just working at restaurants, uh, uh, which are their own, you know, little uh, little slice of hell at times. Uh, the the I would say objectively the most boring job that I had. Was again right out of college, so we're 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 establishing a trend here. But I worked for an architectural uh ex what was it expedition firm, uh that literally so to get a building built in New York City, you have to clear it through the Department of Buildings, and it's a Byzantine system that at that point I don't know if if, if it's changed since COVID, but at, at this point in the mid aughts, you had to physically bring the plans to each borough's department of buildings. Oh dear God. Ooh. So that meant that the firm uh, was my cousin who was the architect who would check plans and everything and mark stuff up and get it ready for review. And then me and my cousin who would take the plans and go wait in line at the Department of Buildings in (laughs) Manhattan, (laughs) Queens, Brooklyn, Bronx, and Staten Island. And so I was a professional line waiter guy, and all I did was take a number, and I would sit at the Department of Buildings. And I'll tell you what, it was the reason that I got into podcasts. I would make sure this was like, I, I, I remember the call I had. I remember where I was in New York City when I, when I was talking to Andrew. And Andrew's like, hey, you know, uh, Apple, uh, iTunes is, is going to have podcasts on it. And I'm like, say no more. And so I, I, I loaded up the, the, the iPod with uh, you know, the, 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 the Ricky Gervais show and, and all the, 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 the hits of that era. And that was the only thing. That made it tolerable. And I pray to God that I had enough podcasts to make it if I had to go up to the Bronx, which was not only 
a subway trip from lower Manhattan all the way up to the Bronx, but then a bus ride from the subway station to the Department of Buildings so I could wait for an hour for somebody to take a look at the plan. So, so you know what's funny is, like, I think about this happening to you and I get angry, but then I imagine it happening to a random page boy in the late 1800s, and it just seems like, oh, well, what are you going to do? That's how the world works. You know, the quality of the life of the 1800s. I mean, right? <laughs> also, this is happening while I have just put myself into tens of thousands of dollars in debt for being a journalist mm. and i'm like how's that how's that plan to uh not use my degree going huh as i'm sitting in line <laughs> i'm sitting in, in 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 the waiting room of the uh brooklyn department of buildings and i'm like i could be it's not like i didn't like reporting i could be reporting right now i probably could be reporting crap stories uh, uh but i could still be reporting but now i'm sitting here in this department of buildings did, and trying to be a sketch comedy did, person did the job pay yes that, like like oh okay. it was no it was i mean it was enough i mean it was not big money but it was enough for me to live in new york city uh uh barely uh but but yeah it was it was okay. I was living with two roommates, uh, uh, but it was, uh, you know, it, it, it was uh, uh, enough, and it, it put me in proximity to do comedy, and that was really what I was in New York City to do. That was just kind of the gig. But, uh, boy, if, if you ever wanted to contemplate all of your life decisions, uh, waiting in the uh, Department of Buildings uh, throughout scattered throughout New York City will certainly give you the, the time to do it. So... When I when I quit my day job at Dell, um, <clears throat> and again I, I try to be pretty pretty fair. Like 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 coming out of college, first job I ever had was uh, in uh, uh, on a phone queue for uh, extended warranty service, and I figured out I think I've told this story before that very quickly I figured out that my real job was to keep making up BS things for people to do until they got so angry that they threatened to sue us unless we sent out a tech and then we would send out a tech for whatever it is, which is why nobody should ever get an extended warranty. Uh, after that, uh, uh, I, I tested video games for a while, uh, which was a good gig, but made no money, but I got to discover a lot of video games. Uh, then, then I ended up at Dell, which uh, was a good enough gig for me to get a house or whatever. But here's the weird part is then I quit my job, a, a pretty good job at Dell on a pretty uh, safe career track. I would say that it, like if I kept putting in the effort, I think I could have really gotten ahead. Um, but then when you're adrift and your wife has said you have one year that I'll keep the lights on, it is astonishing what you will say yes to before realizing what it's like to actually do. Yeah. Uh, like, like, like a, a Marshalls opens in a mall and they need someone in a gorilla suit. <laughs> I'm, I'm You're your guy. The guy. Uh. Right. Uh, um, Chef Boyardee Brands is launching homestyle. I, I think Andrew's mic might be muted. Andrew, is your mic muted? I raise you one Keebler elf. Uh, okay. I, 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 oh no, no, no. I, I feel like I feel like you and I are going to dominate the remainder of this story. Uh, 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 Chef Boyardee launches homestyle bakes, and they need somebody to wear a tuxedo, walk up and down the aisles of 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 five grocery stores per day, spending an hour at each. Uh, interrupting women who are shopping so that they can ask if they can show a magic trick to their child. Oh, my God. <laughs> By the way, the answer is the magic card is the one that says Homestyle Bakes on it. Ah, <laughs> there we go. That was a big gig that I did for like three weeks, uh, uh, four weeks straight. Um, uh, oh, shoot. Um, uh, 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 then, there's, then there's all the other times where it's like you say yes and you realize how woefully inappropriate your style of magic is for whatever event they've done. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 twisting balloons uh, uh, for, for, for drunk women who want them to be phalluses. Uh, it's a uh, get to uh, the bad part. <laughs> <laughs> He's like uh, one easy shape. You got to learn. I, I, I mean, <laughs> my point is, uh, uh, your definition Who books that uh, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> Isn't that the uh, uh, the punchline of the famous joke? Is uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's, it's, I might have to noodle a bit more about which one is specifically the worst. The worst, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I, I, I will say, if, uh, you know, uh, Ill Inc. was saying that she was hoping for crappier jobs, uh, that was the most boring job that I had. Uh, uh, if, we, if we want things that people would not want to do, <sighs> the worst was in journalism on 9-11, calling people that were suspected to be dead in the Pentagon. Nice. And when I asked my editor what I was supposed to do when I got on the phone with them. By the way, my first day as a paid journalist, uh, she said, well, ask for the person that we, sus that we knew worked in the Pentagon, and if they start crying, mark it a maybe. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. That you was, need to write about this. That, I mean, like, this there is, uh, 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 I will always have sympathy for journalists, uh, specifically reporters, not the people that are just doing stuff on, on blogging, which is a different animal, but, like, if you're really digging into stuff, especially if you're working around crime, there is an element of like, you have to check your own humanity of like, why am I calling this person and asking them questions in like their, 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 their darkest hour? And ultimately, the answer is to inform the public, to inform the community. You, you have to kind of keep coming back to these cornerstones. But those calls, oh, God, like that, that, that has shards of my soul were shaved off in those moments yeah and justin kind of omitted like when we were doing manufacturing at a warehouse in margate <laughs> where we'd have we'd get an or i'd be excited because we'd get an order for like 800 of a magic trick which then meant we had to make 800 of a magic trick and i would do like my part of the assembly at home i just be sitting in front of my tv and i'd be putting stuff together but justin for whatever reason you know he would be at the warehouse and sometimes we had the ac but in the middle of the summer it just kind of laughed at you. Yeah, no, it was it was okay. The the biggest uh, uh, thing is just yeah. Whenever it was anything glue based, you know, you had to you had to just be uh. spraying <laughs> the glue in the uh, in, in in the warehouse. But those were, you know, some of the big orders. It's like it's like all right, awesome. But then like God, that shrinker order. I I I, oh. I swear to God that that, oh, God. Sh that shrinker order because that was a, a, an effect that was high dollar. Uh, we had worked really hard on Andrew had worked really hard on shot the video for it. Uh, but it was cumbersome. It was, <laughs> it was a big, it was a big thing and it was hard to put together and it involved just sheets and sheets and sheets of cut plastic that, uh, uh, you know, you, you then had to sort and put into these things and you had to hope that you didn't throw the the sheet plastic into the plastic bags too hard because they might rip through either the oh. bottom or the side uh, uh it, then yeah. we had there was the gut buster period where this was a, <laughs> a trick where i found out that you could use silly putty as a as an analog for skin and you could add some ink to it to make it darker or whatever it worked as a really good analog for skin particularly had to rip Silly putty was expensive. I found the compound that DuPont sold that is actually what silly putty is made from. And so I would buy these 25 pound bales of these buckets of this stuff. But then you had to like, it was the weirdest thing. If somebody walked through and looked through like the door, they'd see this guy pulling this weird flesh like glue, <laughs> cutting it, <laughs> measuring it out. Like it was some sort of like new drug. It was just the most sketchy looking thing in the world. It was, but, it was so funny. Yeah. There was these like, like big bricks of just like human flesh and you just like, like reanimator style, pull out a thing and, and, and weigh it on a little postal scale and then put it in a plastic baggie. Uh, yeah, no, those, the, the, the shrinker order was the one cause that had to get threaded and stuff like that. But yeah. that was like, that was the order that actually bought me my first iPhone. Andrew was very excited. We were very excited that we were able to sell that order. And uh, uh, it, it was, it was a big windfall for us and we were very, very excited. But oh my God, that one the gut busters were were a pain in the ass and and uh, oh God, I can't remember the name of the trick now. But the one with all the uh, the, the 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 cards, the little uh, uh, flash cards. Oh, uh, focal point. Focal point. It was focal oh, point. God, yeah. And focal point had a, had had a gimmick that had to get glued on. That was just a, a yeah. pain in the ass. Oh God, uh, I was so so stupid about every, my entire approach towards everything. Uh, <laughs> I. I have, I learned a lot. Like one of my mentors, one of my heroes was Rand Woodbury. And Rand Woodbury is a great guy. I've probably told this story before, but it's worth telling again. 
when I was in high school, I met him through some cruise ship magicians. He said, oh, you got to meet Rand. Rand is a guy who was building illusions in Davie, Florida. I went there, ran to this warehouse, and he knew how to build stuff. He was friends with David Copperfield, who was performing on cruise ships. And Rand took me under his wing. And Rand, I'd go work for Rand at his workshop. He'd pay me some money, whatever, but I was happy to hang around Rand. Rand comes to me one day. The thing you have to know about Rand is Rand was from the era of cruise ships and stuff when people had big cats. So Rand had a cougar, big cougar, that had been on the ships, then got a little too surly, so the Rand took the cougar off the ship and put the cougar into this, this cage. There was a double cage, double walled cage out there, not the biggest room, you know, smaller than the room I'm in right now. And uh, that's where that cougar lived. That was the cougar's life. That was not a happy life and been there in a long, long, long time. And so that cougar was just kind of old and mean. Rand was on the ships. So Rand comes to me one day and says, Yeah, I've got, you know, I'm doing the cruise ship run. You know, I'm doing this run. Uh, I need you to come feed the cougar. And so I'm like, because I can't ask my wife to do it. I'm like, why can't you ask your wife to do it? (laughs) And also in my imagination, it's like, uh, what you go, you get a couple of, uh, uh, ribeye steaks. You, you sort of stand from five feet away and toss them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's the, 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 uh, there's an outer cage, there's the inner cage. So you unlock you, your hands shaking. You unlock that outer cage. You know, <laughs> as this cougar just paces mountain line, paces back and forth, and looks at you, angry, angry. And you understand, its claws are like big claws. Its oh, teeth yeah. are just these big, this teeth like this bigger. Like this, this is this is a friendly puppy like cougar. Yeah. This is this was a big old one, right? So this thing's pacing back and forth, and this thing weighed 190 pounds. This thing was a big cat. And he's just pacing, just, just looking at you, pure muscle. So you open up the outer cage. Now to feed the cougar, what do you feed a cougar? You feed a cougar a chicken, raw chicken. Like you go get a raw chicken from the grocery store. Now you can't open up that inner cage and toss it too, because once you open up that cage, there's 180, 180 pounds of feline muscle that's stronger than you and faster than you. Yeah. So there's a gap. There's this big of a gap. Okay, so what you do is you go take that raw chicken up to the gap and the cougar comes in, swipes it, bites it, inches. You do not put your fingers through there. You're not putting anything through there because these teeth are like steak knives. It chomps this thing, bites this whole thing through there, pulls it down there, and then it eats it. While staring, it staring at, at it. you. Oh, my yeah. staring God. At you. And then you hear the crunch of the bones. Yeah. It's grinding. Crack. Crack, crack, looking at him. And he like back up close, like, nice, nice kitty. Um, we would every now and then, Rand would use him in a show where he'd make the cat appear. And the way he did that is he had to move the cat from that cage into another cage. And Rand didn't have enough time. You know, that cat was, uh, those cats, you probably wouldn't have a full time trainer and somebody to keep them really there, which wasn't, you know, was, was just an unfortunate situation. And I think that cat may have been a rescue too. Um, he'd help, like, you know, he'd so, anyhow. We have to take him and put him from one cage into the travel cage, right? And the way you do that is you open up this cage, inner cage, and you bring the cat in the travel cage. So Rand's like, Rand's got the collar, Rand's got the, the, the leash, and then Rand gives me this metal pipe. He's like, all right, the cat gets loose. Don't even hesitate. Don't even hesitate. You got to whack it as hard as you can on the head. What? And Rand's kneeling down next to this cage, and I'm thinking of the cat. I'm looking at Rand. I'm like, whose skull is thinner? Yeah. <laughs> So we go transfer the cat into the cage and then it would, you know, uh, you know, transfer the cat there, then go put him the illusion, the illusion. Finally, Rand found uh, a place that was this, this, a rescue, like a real animal sanctuary for wild cats. And Rand got to the point where Rand was like, Rand says, I don't want to, I can't go near the cat because the cat's just too, too angry. And I walk, I go over there one day and there's this guy, this, this like cat trainer, this, you know, like the stocky, like German dude looks like right out of that circus sort of short guy build. There's this truck with like a cage in the back. This guy's there and he's got his trainee kid learning from him. And this guy's walking around the cage going, oh, it's okay. It's all, I understand. And the cat's going, and he's like, no, I understand. It's okay. They're going to be fine. He did spend like an hour just talking to the cat, just soothing voice. And he looks at Rand and he goes, stand back. 
it's time. He opens up the outer cage, walks up the other cage. The there, he walks up, puts the leash on the cat, walks the cat up, and puts him in the back. No, Jesus. it was a cat Hitting. whisperer. It was insane. It was just like he just had a read of these animals, had been around them his entire life, knew what was going on, put him in there, took him to this cat rescue, and so and that was that. It was just watching, watch this guy, and he goes, "It's time." And he walks up, and the cat was just like, "Okay, where are we going?" Wow. I when when now I want to hire this guy <laughs> because okay because. Bryce okay yeah. Bryce <laughs> I meant more for the Weimar honor but yeah <laughs> oh uh, man well I think uh, uh, well, so 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 what what's the lesson to take away from bad jobs because there's the there's a gift in every curse right um uh. At the very least, you get to figure out what it is you're not well equipped to do and what it is that does or does not take advantage of your natural gifts. Um, I learned that I'm not very flexible without structure of some variety. You know, when it, uh, that's the reason I wanted to do my magic show and not walk around in a gorilla suit and just, you know, improv a bunch of, of what, what not yeah. or whatever. That sounds awesome to me though. I mean, do, do I have $50 for you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, from done, I was going to pay you $50. <laughs> I mean, from, my, my very uh, first job, very first day was a movie theater was this second run movie theater. They hired me cause I was 14. And so like, I couldn't legally work, but I wanted to work and I go there and they'd pay me under the table. Um, and the first day, they walked me into the bathroom. They gave me this orange-scented cleanser, which I will never be able to forget the scent of. And he's like, mm. clean the toilets. And I'm like, all right, it's my job. Clean the toilets. And, like, I had a, you know, I have a friend that has a movie set, and there's a problem because, like, the bathrooms weren't clean. And my girlfriend's like, what would you do? I'm like, well, my first one would be I'd pay somebody to come. I'd hire a, I wouldn't make my crew use dirty toilets. I would first, I would see if I could hire a cleaning crew to come in and do it. If I didn't have the money to do it and nobody else had the time, I would clean it. It's like gross. They're like, just, I'm like, I know, but I don't want people to use that. And that's not beneath me. That right. is yeah. not beneath me. Yeah. There is, if I have to, you know, I have, I have friends that like they get out of work, they go through rough spots and all they do is wait for the next ship to come in because they refuse to do anything that they consider beneath them. Yep. I don't have that. No. If, if all of a sudden I was in a financial bind or whatever like this, and I'm like, Oh, I could do DoorDash or whatever. And I could, you know, I could do this efficiently, whatever. I would do it. I don't care. Like, you're not going to, nobody's going to ever look at me and go, ha ha, you have to do this and make me feel bad. You know, because like, I just, if it's, if it's, if somebody else is capable of doing it, I'm capable of doing it. Nothing's beneath me. Yeah. I mean, I think in that regard, I mean, with limits, <laughs> like, yeah. Andrew, I've got an offer for you. Uh, the biggest thing that I learned, and that was for all the, the situations specifically with, uh, you know, like, working with Andrew or, or, you know, through, through journalism or whatever, is that you, you, especially if you want to do something creative, it really, 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 really helps. And I cannot stress this enough to understand how the machine really works and not just your own creative impulses, not even just your own ability to produce, uh, your ability to fit into the larger system, to understand what marketing is, to understand like for, for Andrew, it was a crash course of like, okay, how do you, you come up with a magic trick? Let's say it's a great magic trick. Everybody loves it. Everybody that you showed it, you go to magic live and everybody you're showing it to is like, this is the greatest thing ever. What happens then? Like, here are the people that you talk to. Here is what you can expect to sell it for. Here's what a, a jobber rate is. Here's what an invoice looks like. Like, here's what it takes to manufacture it. Here's how you source out how you manufacture it. Here's where it's inefficient. Here's where it is efficient. Like, that's just, it's all those details that I think creatives in general get scared of and shy away from because they're not the fun part. They're not the create, they're not the, they're not the creative part. But if you really want to make this a living, either you're doing it all yourself or you better understand what that system is. Because if you're going to get taken advantage of, that's how you're going to get taken advantage of it. It's, it's the... We Oh, go ahead. 
I just would just follow through. We we ran that magic, and we we never should have had a magic business like that. We never should have done a thing <laughs> like that. That was that was the the worst use of our skill. It's not like it's not like we're a situation where Brian is producing multimedia content and then builds like a big you know think geek like store on top of it. We're making magic tricks for the small narrow audience. It was the dumbest use of our skills whatsoever. That being said, was we were incredibly efficient. We learned yeah. how to be extremely efficient. We we could turn a profit on like 200, you know, average order beat 800, 800 units. We turned a profit on like the first 100 or first 200 yeah. units. We always did that. So that was part of the problem, though, is we learned how to just squeeze profit out of this stuff because we're very efficient on this. At the bigger side, we lost sight of building a much bigger, better business. But I would say appreciate to this day, though, is that when I would advise other magicians, oh, I'm going to build a product. I'm going to make 20,000 of them on my credit card. I'm like, that's the horrible idea. And, you know, I, I know a guy that's living in a warehouse now because he did that. And I'm like, it's just you try to explain those, where those margins come in. Well, Sorry, and, Brian, and, 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 and uh, I think it's important to learn the lesson and hold on to the lesson of, of what your quote unquote real job is. Uh, at the very height of my touring career in the college market, uh, there are a lot of people who got confused who thought, oh, my job is to have a very good show and to be a talented magician and go from place to place to place and be amazing. Um, I, on the other hand, was fortunate enough to figure out, oh, no, 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 no. My job is to babysit these students who are new freshmen from the hours of 6 until 7.30 and to make them feel like they've had an experience that they can bond over down the road later. Now, uh, I happen to do it by doing a magic show that I happen to think is pretty good, but built into that, like once you review it through that frame, you understand it's like, no, 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 that means that there needs to be moments that I cause people to interact with each other. There needs to be catchphrases that they can all quote at each other and remember, oh my yeah. God, we had that bonding experience together and so on. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, and, and it's because of that, that, that down the road, I never got confused about what I was doing when I was doing, you know, scam school, scam nation, Monorog, or any of that stuff. It's like, no, no, no. What I'm doing is I'm creating a community. You know, this is, this is the, uh, the, the, the center spoke, the axle around which everything else will spin. And then, like you said, build a think geek, uh, on top of it. I, and then Brian, like apps, it, it really, it's really people going back and just kind of like re listen to what Brian said about that, like really dissect what, what the work is, what the job is, because I think the mistake I made so many times is I want to go do this. Oh, they hired me to do this. It's like, they hired you because they want this thing here. And, and at children's entertainment, like you could even apply it. Like I was, you know, as a teenager at kids magic shows, if I were to do that, be like, Oh, I know what I need to do. I need to do like 10 minutes of magic and 20 minutes of cool photo apps for all the kids have cool photos to take home to their mom and show this. Correct. Because then it's going to look like, oh, this is an amazing, well, I know there's 10 minutes of really good magic and then me like letting kids hold props or making them float, whatever, because that's today. Like, what's your job? Your job is to have that mom have a birthday party, the dad have a birthday party. Everybody talks about how cool that is, which means on social media, they need to see photos of kids having a blast. That's why... Think of things that do really well, like bounce houses, face painting, all this, because these are visible signs that people are having fun. And and so. not not for nothing, and and with all respect, uh, Penn and Teller don't hang out for as long as their entire stage show. That runtime, they don't do that again to take photos out in front of their theater at the Rio because. They, they just love the adoration or whatever. It's because they understand that the, the, the real project that they're selling is the Penn and Teller experience. And yeah. part of that involves, yes, you do have to bother to have a Penn and Teller show. Yes, you do have to have kind of a preamble that builds up to it, which is why Penn puts in the extra effort to play to jazz play the beforehand. Yep. And, then, and then afterwards, uh, part of the experience is another hour, hour and a half of hanging out and not just, you know, okay, okay, okay for the photos, but instead having a good time, being engaged in, in, no, in that is, interacting with If anybody's with never seen... Penn and Teller work a post show line like that is you know pros they yes. are professional like uh, uh people they give you 
if you come in and, and you got that story that that oh my god like uh, I remember the first time that I saw blah 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 oh blah, my god tell me all about it they will uh, they my will guess listen is to all of it between all you, of between it. you me and the wall uh, they've probably heard all of your stories yes but they also are on duty and they're listening to you right now in that moment and that's and that's you know the biggest thing is that they know no matter what if somebody pays money they they might think that the pre-show music sucked. They might not even like the show itself, but they know for sure that if you want to talk to them, you will talk to them, and not a whole lot of other top-flight, big-name entertainers in Vegas are going to stand outside their show and 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 listen to your story and and give you a picture and give you a selfie. Like uh, uh, that is that is that is something that they are that they are great. But that's because again, they know. The real product. They know what they need to do. They know that, especially in a world where social media is a thing, that that every single night that they do a show, that's going to be just that many photos on Facebook. That's going to be that many more uh, 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 pictures of spreading the word. And, like, you know, uh, I'd say watching them specifically, you know, as they went through the real heyday of Pre Fool Us, where they were, where Penn was going on every reality competition show and they were doing every possible thing. And I forget where I heard him talk about it, but he was like, yeah, like our job is to fill hotel suites at the Rio. That's what we do. Like people come in, (laughs) they see the show and the show is good, but the show can be, you know, it can, it can go up and down, like in terms of, 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 of the thing, but the more people come to see us, the more people are definitely going to stay at the Rio, the more that we are, are golden there. That's our job. So me going on, you know, whatever, who can eat the most mustard, you know, on VH1. Uh, it's my favorite show on VH1. <laughs> like, uh, uh, that's, he's into it. He's like, cool, as long as I get to say, I'm very excited to be here, uh, uh, coming right off stage at the Rio All Suites Hotel and Casino. Like, that's that's it. And that's, you know, th- those are people that that get the the, the, the point of it, get, get why they're doing it, and, and they will, and uh, he, you, you will never go broke doing that. Here's Here's the part that, somebody may not have heard us say yet is there's bliss in understanding what you're really up to, what you're really doing, what, what, um, you know, even, even the live shows that we do, what we're doing is we're, we're, uh, we're having communion. We're having fellowship We're we're gathering together as a community with, with, you know, we're, we're uh, detailing our shared values and, yeah. and that, and that makes all of us, feel a little bit brighter for the rest of our day. And um, nothing is taken away by saying, what, you mean we're not really here for the SpaceX commentary? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's I don't know. I, I, I think there's bliss and it's important to know your real purpose. Yeah. I remember on the subject of the autograph line too, like David Copperfield for years, mm-hmm. you'd go to a David Copperfield show David would sit there and he'd be there for an hour signing autographs. And also it was like, it it helped. It did several things. One was the, you know, the, where they're selling all the merchandise, David will sign this after the show. Okay. Let me buy something. Uh, Second was just fan building. You know, as a kid, I'd have David Copperfield poster on my wall signed by David Copperfield. And that was just like, that was a very smart thing that for, and he just built up that recognition and doing that. And like the pin and teller, he doesn't do that in Vegas anymore, but like, yeah, Penn and Teller just they hang out. You're like, what? Like, they're real? And people are, it's weird because like there are certain mediums where it's really bad. You're going to get everybody, when the less anonymous the medium, generally the better behaved people are. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it, just a side note, it's kind of relevant, whatever. Like when one of the things we would do when we were running our magic business, if we ever had a complaint or somebody was irate, I would write back and I would try to solve it or Justin would write back and I'd put my phone number there. Yeah. I said, hey, just give me a call if you want to talk about it. Do you know how many people called me up? Nobody. Zero. Everybody yeah. appreciated Zero. it, though. Every single person. Yep. Um, they're, they're, yeah, I, my, my, my move is I would give them my personal email. I would say, I would say uh, uh, number one, first customer service rule, respond as fast as possible. Right. Like, even if it's mm-hmm. just looking into this, we will be in touch right back. The second you get it, if you can get an email back, then number one, you've you've taken away the biggest problem that you would have, which is I emailed them and they didn't even get back to me because everybody's version of they didn't even get back to me can range from 10 minutes to 
uh, 10 years, depending on, on who you are and what your, what your, what your mindset is. But if you hit them back ASAP, then that's the thing. And then the second thing is like, yeah, give them the, the like, all right, here's what I can find out. And oftentimes it's going to the same USPS portal that they have access to, but it's like, according to the United States postal service, it, it should be here. It should be there. If it's not there in two days, please don't hesitate to call me at this number or here's my personal email address. Uh, uh, please hit me up and I will make sure that either you will get a, a new thing in the mail that I'll send out priority or your thing will arrive and everything will be fine. Uh, yep. And, and uh, I guess one last, one last note on top of that is in the spirit of figuring out what your real job is uh, on top of all of that, within every difficulty is an opportunity. So oftentimes when somebody is upset, cause I'll, I'll get this stuff like in passing where it's, for example, David was laid out with COVID and, you know, it, it had been two and a half, yeah. three days. This is David Rowan who runs Bizarre uh, Magic. Scam stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, and so I saw that somebody was starting to get fired up and I just leapt in. I'm like, Hey, it's Brian. This is my personal phone number. I'm not sure what's up, but it sounds like you're upset. Uh, what, uh, uh, please tell me everything. Also, here's, here's a picture of my daughter, you know, like, yeah. like, like, uh, just as, as fast as I can real humans, let's do real human stuff. Let's, yeah. let's figure stuff out. Uh, yeah, it, it's the people business. Ultimately, every business is the people business. I I want to close. This is actually touching back on something from weird things, but this was something that just came across my 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 transom, which was apparently a statement on Reddit from a Blue Origin employee. Okay. Uh oh. Dear Weird Things Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> would no, you not please so stop? Yeah, we, we, such we heard jerks. you talking. Ass. <laughs> uh, the TLDR employee here, most if not all of us, do not agree with the recent PR campaign activity from Blue. Uh, and basically, if you would do a search, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's a it's like. Hey, yeah, no, we're not happy with the way this has been happening. We root for other space companies. We're excited to see the Starship getting stacked, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was a very, very good sort of like inside of like, you know, one time we sometimes we attach on the meta thing. We, we, when we deal with people, we get upset about like, oh, I'm this, I'm angry at this company. Like one person somewhere made a decision. It's not everybody else. You know, yeah. it's not all of this. And also, you know? and even so that one people, person probably if you're at a cocktail party would say, yeah, probably should have thought of a different angle. I also think that, I don't know whether this is blue origin specifically or the national team in, in general, but that feels very Washington lobbyisty. And, and that is, that is a, a operation that is very far from the engineering of rockets. Yeah. There's there's Eric Berger, Berger, who did the wonderful book Lift Off, I highly recommend it. His tweet, his his tweets are really worth following on this. He'd put out what, some theories, and one of his theories is that the head of uh, Bob Smith, who's the head of SpaceX, I said head, head of he was just the head of Blue Origin. He's like, uh, it may be his job on the line. He may have been told you've got to get this or you're out. Is this? Yeah. And so that might be very desperate sort of measures by this. But ultimately, it's Bezos, who I. I have an immense amount of respect for, uh, and I think is you know if, if he were more hands on a Blue Origin, I think it would be an incredibly capable company. But yeah, so anyhow, Joan, any picks? Um, I went and saw Free Guy. I'm sure it's a fine movie, but but boy, are movie theaters getting reaccustomed to how to run movie theaters? Um, uh, I I did not have a great experience at the movie theater. What what what, what happened? Not fun what happened? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, uh, 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 the movie theater across the street used to uh, uh, they they didn't have much of a pre-show, so they would do crazy things like here's an awesome fifteen-minute segment from the Princess Bride. They would play that beforehand, or whatever. Yeah. Or you've got your Alamo Draft House, which is like, uh, uh, hey, here's a perfectly curated thirty-five minutes yeah. that that tells all the stories that you need to know leading up to this movie, this Thanos snap, right? Um, this was the hottest of garbage of 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 just uh, on loop fifteen minute uh, or fifteen seconds of saying, make sure to download this app for the latest in Numi news or whatever yeah. the hell. And oh yeah. Movie. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right, right. Whatever Maybe. it was, it was awful. And, and, uh, on the way in, you know, I said, Hey, um, we're hungry and we are a half an hour before the movie. 
what is the best way for us to get service? And they said, go sit in your seat and we'll take care of you. Um, spoiler alert, they did not. They did not. <laughs> and uh, uh, the movie started and I walked out. And I was like, what, what up? And they're like, they're like, uh, you're supposed to be in your seat, sir. I'm like, yeah, the movie has already started. <laughs> yeah. And there's like, oh, fine, we'll send someone. And then yeah. uh, okay. we got yeah. we got a popcorn. It was awful. That, it was awful. That sucks. Uh, so so I, don't go I, see Free Guy. Uh, the well, story. Uh, I mean, that's that's I I honestly don't know how severely that impacted my experience of seeing Free Guy. What I otherwise, I think you know, seems big- like a fine rip off of Mythic Quest. A big a big test was I think the release of the Suicide Squad because that was free. If you had HBO Max, that was free. It wasn't one of these Disney pay thirty bucks. Yeah. And and we were like, oh, this is out. And we were like, we were planning to go see it in the theater, but then we're like, oh, we can watch it at home. And like it was an edge case movie where we're like, mm, and I would just see it at home. And and that's I think movie theaters, when we're like you're not too sure about the experience you're going to have. You'd rather see it at home than you're losing out. If you can't bring, make that experience of the movies better than being at home, then we we stayed at home. I went across the street, got a couple frozen pizzas. We had popcorn ever. Great time. See, and, and it was like, and, and you got to compete with that. The, the flip side is I have children, which means all movies are now presented in heckle vision uh, <laughs> by bad First time hecklers and, and so amateur hecklers. Yes, exactly. Every <laughs> movie is amateur heckler night, and the only way to see them in silence you know where they is to go to the from, movie Brian? theater. <laughs> where did they pick this this up from, Brian? I, I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> okay, okay. Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got a quick pick. Go if you're thinking. Pick, picky, quick. Uh, we we finished Hannibal a few weeks ago on it's spoiler in time, and uh, I kept threatening the guys that we should find a way to do a movie marathon of the Hannibal Lecter movies, and I have I have since fallen on the sword and taken it upon myself to go watch those films. And I have to say, uh, a uh, the Silence of the Lambs is free on YouTube. You can just go and watch it. That and um, what was the second one after that? Hannibal. You can go watch both of those just for free on YouTube. YouTube yeah. has them there. Um, Silence of the Lamb really holds up. I think this is really interesting. And uh, being able to contrast it with the show that, that we just watched where Hannibal um, is, is, is a little more flamboyant, is, is a little as, as kind of a different perspective than Anthony Hopkins' Hannibal Lecter. Um, I, I think it, it's it's fantastic. I, I think it's it's a really, really solid story um, with with good stakes. I don't know that Hannibal or Red Dragon are quite at the same level, especially because they don't have Judy Foster. Uh, but Spoiler alert, they're not. Or, or Jody. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, yeah, you know what? It, but it was a thing where I could t- I said, hey, I want to watch this thing. And I put it in Google and Google says, we've got it for free, dude. So um, Which was, movies did you watch? Uh, so I did watch Silence of the Lambs. I did finish Hannibal. And I... Uh, and midway through Red Dragon. Oh, so you haven't? I didn't. Okay. I didn't. I, but I think I saw Red Dragon as a kid. So and so, and yeah, but, you but, but, st- yeah, you you didn't see what Red Dragon the original Red Dragon Manhunter. Yeah, Manhunter. I have not seen Manhunter. That's right. It's a Manhunter in your life. And then there's because yeah. Brett's Brian 80s. Cox is Han- Hannibal Lecter, right? I want to yep. see that. I want to see yeah. the succession. Yep. And guys. that's that's this is a very that Lecter was great. It was a very and that's the as his and and. Uh, Anthony Hopkins, I think, are both phenomenal versions of this. The, the, the thing with Hannibal is that is if you read, if you read those the 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 books, and then if you read like High Smith's talented Mr. Ripley, you see that he starts trying to shape him into a Mr. Ripley type character, which it was a very influ- it's not obvious in Red Dragon, but I'm not obvious in like Silence, and then a bit more once you get to Hannibal, you're like, this is Ripley. You know, this is very much like that, which I think that at the at the loss of what made Hannibal great, because also he's trying to like in the talented Mr. Ripley, those books, like they're trying to like, you're watching a sociopath who's very adaptive. And if you watch like the later one, they did those movies are check those out, read talented, sure. watch talented Mr. Ripley. Then there's the follow up with uh, John Malkovich playing that character. And it's very, you pick up a lot of similar themes with like later on with him, like Hannibal trying to have a normal life and whatever, and being a sociopath hmm. and Malkovich just Malkovich. Yeah. Um, and it uh, was, and, and it's been cool to kind of recontextualize parts of, the Hannibal TV show and see how they adapted and pulled and kind of uh, rearranged the timeline from what's in the movies and what's in the books and stuff. So uh, pretty easy to find. One, one, of, my, one of my favorite uh, stories about Anthony Hopkins playing Hannibal Lecter is uh, I forget where I got this from, but it was uh, Jim Carrey 
recounting a conversation that he had with Hannibal Lecter or with uh, with Anthony Hopkins, and uh, Jim Carrey's like, "Oh, well, you know, for Ace Ventura, I I patterned all of the body movements off a bird, and oh. so it's like just the way he like." moves he moves like a bird and anthony hopkins got really excited and he's like oh, i did the same thing with hannibal lecter <laughs> and he's like he's like like what what was it he's like it was a spider and then oh, the yeah. way the way that uh, uh uh jim carrey describes it is like all of a sudden anthony hopkins just like transforms like into in hannibal him, lecter, into hannibal lecter <laughs> and you realize like like, oh my God, this is this is just an amazing thing. But, but uh, for somebody that obviously Jim Carrey, because he is so kinetic, you think of him as a very you know visual, uh, physical performer. But but you don't think of it until like you you watch uh, Silence of the Lambs and you're like, oh, that dude's a spider. And yeah. you're like, damn, you're right, he's spidering around. There was uh, every year my agent comes from new york to la and she stays at this super swanky beverly hills hotel because she comes out to go like you know go talk to the studios and so we go have dinner you know at a place that's way more sophisticated than i am and i walk in there and i always feel so awkward because like everybody's fancy and sophisticated and like in my first years i'd get i pull up in my scion with a dented door you know <laughs> and uh we're sitting there once i'm sitting sitting for dinner and uh we look over and it's small dining room. There's not a few, lot of people there. And the perfect thing you've ever seen was sitting at a table, at the, like just two tables over, is this Anthony Hopkins reading his Kindle. <laughs> just eating dinner, wow. just reading his Kindle. And it was just, it was just as like, he looked like proper guy just sitting there reading, consuming his dinner. And it was just like this. I'm like, this is, this is how I imagined him, you know? Yes. And I didn't yeah. say anything, didn't I? I was just, I was just happy to see him in his L like that he was probably there shooting westworld oh oh yeah that would have been around the time yeah uh so uh my pick off of all of that would be um it's a movie that like is i don't remember how much i loved it or didn't love it but i do remember how much i loved malkovich's performance in it because you know john malkovich but that is ripley's game which is, if you ever see the talented Mr. Ripley, it's just watching that character. So it's a very, it's another, uh, very you know, sociopath sort of character. So that was like back in like two thousand two. Oh two, yeah. Which um, wow, so, so O2 very, Malkovich. So that's around being John Malkovich. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. That Ninety-two percent on like Rotten Tomatoes, according to Wikipedia. So wow. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize how many times, like, yeah, it was America, how many times, like, that story had been adopted before. But, you know, if you just, you see, like, elements, like, I do this in my books, like, like my my Jessica Blackwood, my first book, was very much inspired by, like, aspects of Silence of Lambs and this and that. And, like, you you see this and then you watch how much Harris, like, I, th I think was influenced by Highsmith Ripley. So, yeah. if you like Hannibal, check that out. Nice. Cool. Uh, uh, last quick pick. After I watched Suicide Squad, I was on a flight and they had uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 for free. And so I watched the first half. Spoiler alert. Script's awesome. It's just such a great script. Great. Every every thing adds to another thing. Everything is 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 motivated by the thing that happened before. It's like uh, uh, people will go back through that first couple phases of Marvel movies and and, and you will just kind of understand it just mapped the, you know, cinema. Like it just is such yeah. an achievement. Yeah, that's the. I don't know if we're gonna see more of that from Marvel. I don't know uh, of of that. I, 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 not not to open up. Like I, I I know we gotta wrap up, but <laughs> but but it's like man, I got I got fifteen to twenty minutes more in the tank where all I could do is talk about how loosey goosey the MCU has gotten and about how. By virtue of everything being celestial, I've lost interest in uh, everything. All, all I'll say is that if you lined all 10 rings up together and put a percentage at the end of it, that's my excitement level. Uh, but I don't know. It's I'll been... see him. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. I, I was, uh, we, uh, a Marvel conversation can happen another time. Hope it's great. Me too. Always hoping. I, 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 I like the talent. I, 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 I like the talent in other stuff. And Marvel is I... consistently. Every, I will say this, with a few notable exceptions. Uh, uh, by and large, whenever I've been like, well, how are they going to do this? I've walked out of the theater saying, wow, that was really good. Yeah. Yeah. 
gentlemen. Captain Marvel. Yeah, it's been weird, but it's after. It's after. It's been weird because it's not after. It's, after. it's been weird right. that it's so after. Yep. All righty. Awesome. All right. Love you guys. Uh, good stuff. Yeah, we're going to go offline uh, 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 real quick here, but uh, thank you. Check around. We got Court Killers in a couple of hours, everybody. And uh, we're going to go get ready for that. Yeah, baby. Bye, See you, folks. Bye.